like the video. Thumb up the video. Set the stage with the lights off. Let the little nigga breathe to the fight sloth. You ain't never like the moon with the bright sauce. Hell, Mary, they despise what the light brought. Let them roach niggas bleed if they can't see. No side near the TV, what you can't be. They say that murder on my mind, now they can't breathe. Take a picture of the crew, that's your last peep. Oh, I need me your love, yeah, that's just me. Just keep them jumping like some frogs, so they might be a light when the sun's up. And they don't really want to bleed from the gun playing like mine. Nigga smoking weed on the one way street, nigga. Yeah, we see we outside with it. Pull up to the base like we might be with it on guard. Side these niggas like bullshit and they fraud. Let me chop them down with the saw. Walk them down like they live hard. Just as tough as you gon' be in, we too hard. the toughest environment to be in we are not biased over here at once when we first started out i keep it 100 yes we was yes i was and so i have moved away from it i have to give the people a fair deal a fair debate and so now we are bias free i have no friends man when i'm doing debates y'all understand that i have no friends when i'm doing debates all right so we got vocab malone in the building now i forgot who the challenger was i really did forget i think it was vocab yes because he wanted to smoke with zion lex if i'm if i'm mistaken vocab you can let me know cut them cameras on brothers turn on them cameras let's hit the lights y'all on the big stage now i think it was vocab who was the challenger if i'm not mistaken and so I've, I've told y'all earlier that vocab was going around, walking up on every Hebrew he could find, taking it to him, banging and going in. But it's one Hebrew 
he have never crossed yet. And that's the man that y'all see on the screen. Zion, the lion, roaring king, Zion Lex. So vocab is going to have a different conversation with Zion Lex because he's not the average Israelite, bro. I'm trying to show you that. And so the topic of today's discussion, debate, will be Zion Lex versus Vocab Malone. Who are the biblical Israelites of today? That right there is the title. That is the question. And we want to see what's going on with that. You both have two minutes in the opening round to explain what you are here to do, what you are here to prove. And we're going to have three minutes. Uh, uh, round one will be 15 minutes. Round two will be 10 minutes. Cross-examination, 10 minutes each. Okay, so y'all each have 10 minutes each. And then we have a third round for 10 minutes each. Something a little different, but it's good. The audience gets to have a Q&A, 20 minutes total of Q&A. All right? So are there any questions, brother? No, I'm clear. Let's go. Let's get it in. Any questions, vocab? Uh, no, I don't think so. Just other, I'll be able to share my my screen. Yes, you'll be able to share your screen. Yeah, that's without question. <laughs> you will be able to share your screen, and so you want to get up, get um, pause, pause, pause for all of y'all little young minds out there that's thinking crazy. So you want to be able to pull your screen up, brother. We got uh -huh. Rock in the building. We brought out the champs. Zion Lex and Vocab has brought out the scholars. They in the building. I see you. We got Brother Lie, Sister Freedom, Captain Tazoriot. The heavy hitters are out. Cole, Christina, Nick, the former champion. Of <laughs> Shout out to Christina, Nick. I mean, not former champion, but God damn it, she is a reigning champ. He is a champion over there. All right? So we can't, I told you, it's bringing out all the champs. We got Christina Nick in the building, y'all. Uh, Benita Sutton is in the building. My man, Bond Dog, Silent K, you name it. We here. The heavy hitters are here. All right? Um, Gemini the Goddess is in the building. Who else we got? Melanated the God. Melanated God is in the building. Of course, I oh man, I said the captain. I I'm giving everybody a shout out. All right, so let me get this um timer set. Um, let me get this timer set. Where we at? Where's the timer? Here go the timer. Here, you got two minutes in this round for your opening statement. Are you ready, brother? Yes. Yeah. Time will start when you start. Let's get it. All right. Excellent. I want to start off with a few important considerations. This is kind of food for thought. Time as we asked this question about who the biblical Israelites are. Firstly, what, according to Scripture, did Christ say he would build? Everyone think about that. If you, if you know your Bibles, even if you don't hold the New Testament as authoritative, think about a New Testament answer to this. What did Christ say he would build? Was it the nation of Israel? The answer is the church. Greek, the ecclesia. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is something that doesn't seem to be in existence. Otherwise, why would he be building it? Yet this is what he's saying he's going to do, and it centers on the ministry and mission of the apostles and the disciples. The contextual background is important. Matthew 16, 16 and 17, you have Simon Peter replying, you are Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, my father who is in heaven. Notice the emphasis there. How did he come by way of that information? Secondly, within what community is conflict now resolved? Is it the nation of Israel? Answer. The church, the ecclesia. And so notice this is after the passage we just read, because this is in Matthew 18. So that's important to understand. 
This has to do with church discipline and how the community self-regulates in regards to standards. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. The church is what Christ came to build. He is building something new. The church is the new covenant people of God. That's why conflict is resolved within that body. So when we ask who are the biblical Israelites of today, my thesis is through Messiah, the church is true Israel now and for all eternity. I'm a deep- all right. That's vocabs opening right there. Let's head on over to my brother Zion Lex. And as we head on over to him, please thumb up the video. Like the video. Thumb up the video. Thank you. Thank you. Brother Zion Lex, you are on the clock. Time will start when you start. This is a two-minute opening. Let the people know what you are here today to prove, brother. Just before you start my time, I'm just going to need you to share my screen. I got something up as well. Okay, that's what I'm waiting on. Oh, here we go. Your screen is up. All right, perfect. So I want to say from the outset, uh, Vocab uh, is is not having a good day. Um, The title of tonight's debate is Who Are the Biblical Israelites Today? Um, Anyone that looks at the title already knows that this is a historical conversation. Now, I am a biblical person myself. Um, I'm the head of an, uh, an academy. Uh, I've been teaching for many, many years. When we're having conversations about the Bible and what the Bible has to say exclusively, there's always a time, place, and a space for that. But tonight's debate is who are the biblical Israelites today? So that means the bulk of the debate is historical information, right? It's 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 an easy thing uh, to think in one's mind that one is going to go into the Bible, pull out Bible verses to prove who a historical people are It's another thing altogether when you enter a historical setting to talk about who are the biblical Israelites today. So I want to say that from the outset, uh, my brother, Vocab, is not having a good day. Um, And I yield my time. That's all I have to say. Like the video. Thumb up the video. All right. Let's go ahead right into um, round one. Vocab, you got 15 minutes in this round. Time will start when you're ready. All right, you would be able to share my screen again. Can you All right. uh, share the Ms. slides? Ms. Yes, Ms. there you go. Thank Ms. you. Time will start when you're ready. All right. All right, we're going to get into this. Uh, already, notice I stated a positive claim and try to explain what I'm going to try to do. Zion just criticized, didn't offer anything, and made a mistake already. He said, right. this is you his- ready? Time yes. Is yeah. He said, this is a historical consideration. And yet the title literally says, who are the biblical Israelites of today? So it's a current consideration and it's biblical. He said, you can't just pull out Bible passage to say, who are the Israelites? Well, it's literally in the title. It says biblical Israelites of today. So I'm not sure what title he's reading, but we're not. It doesn't say who are the historical Israelites outside of the Bible or something. Somebody's mic's not muted. I'm getting sniffles, sniffles and stuff like that. If you could mute that, please. So the thesis statement is thoroughly scriptural, and it's important because it's biblical. That's the very title we've got going on here. I'm going to show four supporting lines of biblical evidence for this question, the biblical Israelites of the day. and There's really no other way to answer this than what I'm going to answer this. What I mean is, this is something that Scripture clearly teaches that you really can't deviate from and be faithful to Scripture. The faithful and true Church of Christ is the eschatological. That means for today, for this time, which is the end time since Christ has come, these latter days, as the Scripture itself declares. Therefore, Christians are eschatological Israelites. What does this mean? It means the church embodies the ultimate fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham. This means that Christians are the eschatological, biblical Israelites of today. Here's what it does not mean. That does not mean the church is literally or ethnically Israel. This does not preclude a mass conversion of ethnic Israelites in the future. This does not mean that ethnic Israel's failure is total, final, or permanent. This does not mean there isn't a remnant of believing Israel in the present. So that's what it doesn't 
mean? But it is true that the church is the true Israel of God. That's Galatians 6, 16. Made up of true children of Abraham. That's Galatians 3. Who are the true Jews. That's Romans chapter 9. It is the true holy nation. That's 1 Peter. Next verse as well. A kingdom of priests who offer spiritual sacrifices. That's Romans 12 and Romans 15. After having been redeemed from Egypt by the death of, the, of, of Christ, their Passover. That's 2 Corinthians. The church is not a physical nation, but a spiritual one. Christ says, I didn't come to build that in John 18 before Pilate. The very body of Christ of which each individual Christian is a member. And some of those quotes, I'm paraphrasing the law of Christ by Charles, Charles Letter. First biblical line of evidence, we really got to start in the beginning. God called Abraham to bless all the families of the earth. We need to understand the point of the call of Abraham. Why did God call Abraham? Genesis 12, 3, to bless all the families of the earth. This is fundamental to the biblical story. Here's what Yahweh says. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There's two alternative ways to translate it if you would like. The idea is the same. The families of the earth descend from who, ladies and gentlemen? From Adam. What was Adam's God-given mission? So now we're going back to the first covenant in the garden. What jobs did Adam have to do? Be fruitful and multiply. Rule and subdue. Cultivate and keep. Live in community. Live in fellowship with God. But he failed. He was supposed to do those things, but sin equals expulsion, equals the mission hindered, equals the curse upon all of Adam's descendants. And that is why when you get to the New Testament, the question is not, are you in Jacob or in Esau or some under, other type of arrangement? It's, are you in Adam? Are you in Christ? That is the fundamental Fundamental question every person must ask themselves, because Adam, our federal head, failed in his mission. What will Yahweh do? What he always planned. Call out a new people from Adam's offspring. This is where the picture of Abraham comes into play. And yes, I understand there's a name change. I'm using the name Abraham throughout. To bless all the families of the earth, the way in which God would ultimately do this is by the chosen seed, which was prophesied in Genesis 3, who is the Messiah, the Christ. This is literally, precisely the argument of Galatians 3, 7 through 9, 16 and 22. Know then, it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. That's very important. We can't let this slide. How does the Bible define who were the sons of Abraham? If you're of his same trust in Yahweh's promises, continuing and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, which is the same way Abraham was justified because he was justified prior to his circumcision. Continuing, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, now look, quoting Genesis 12, 3 here, and you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. This is fundamental. This is the biblical way to define it. I don't know why other people want to define it other ways. Why would we define the sons of Abraham differently than God defines it? I'm not sure. The promise of Genesis 12, 3. This is from uh, Expositor's Bible Commentary, which, like the declaration of Abraham's righteousness by faith, chronologically precedes the institution of circumcision, included the Gentiles with the Jews in the covenant of blessing Abraham, the neither Jew nor Gentile proto-believer. That is a good description of who he is, because think about what he's called out of, who he's called out of, right? He's just a regular old guy like everybody else. There are no descendants of Abraham at this point. Thus becomes for Paul, the father of all who believe, whether Jew or Gentile. So Paul adds that all who believe as Abraham did are blessed through justification as a result of their faith. Continuing with Galatians 3. The promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say into offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. Notice the emphasis here. It's on the Messiah. Messiah changes everything because he brings in a new covenant. Continuing, the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So who inherits the promises given to Abraham? Those who believe. 
It's not based upon blood. It's based upon belief. And that's why Matthew 28, at the end of the gospel, Jesus tells his disciples to go into all the nations and commands them to do what he told them to do. He is, in a meaningful way, a new Moses. And indeed, that's what was predicted in Deuteronomy 18. So a second line of evidence is that being counted as true Israel was never strictly or merely based on biology. Let's take a look at this. You see a narrowing focus within the divine promise. The Abrahamic promise was not all-inclusive. God did not include every person descended from Abraham, did not include Ishmael, did not include Esau. And indeed, Paul emphasizes God's choice in Romans 9 in this very manner. God gets to decide who is Israel. So birth to the, quote, right family is not enough. This election is according to God's will, God's grace. It's not DNA or biology or blood. That's not the defining factor. Let me give you some evidence from Scripture. John 1, 11 through 13, focusing in on verse 12, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Notice, Paul and John are not at odds here. This is the New Testament witness and indeed faithful to the old as well. Verse 13, who were born not of blood. So why are we going to be focusing on blood? I know I'm not, because why? The scripture's not. So why would we go against the scripture's emphasis? I'm not going to do that tonight. Nor the will of the flesh. I mean, do we need any more? I guess we do because the next line, nor of the will of man. Now we have the source, but of God. This is why John the Baptist told Jewish people who came to him and thought they were going to be okay. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. It is not enough. It's never been enough. And the next line speaks of their coming judgment. The same thing happens in John 3. When Nicodemus wants to know how to attain the kingdom of God, why does Jesus not say, keep the law, statutes, and commandments? Why doesn't he say, retain your identity? Why doesn't he say something like that? He tells him he needs to be born again. It's almost as if the natural birth that Nicodemus currently possesses as a faithful Jew in the first century is not enough. Nicodemus does not understand this because there's an element of hiddenness in the Old Testament. But when you read Ezekiel, you'll see, oh, that's where this comes from. That's why you've got to be born of the spirit. Look at verse six. That which is born of the flesh is the flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Jesus is plainly telling us what we need to enter into the kingdom. And it's not ethnicity. So if Zion was Ashkenazi making whatever arguments he's going to make tonight, my arguments would literally be the same. Because I'm sticking to the biblical text regardless of what the other person is saying. Now, we'll deal with his emphasis when it comes to it. But look at John continuing on with this, with the words of Jesus in John chapter 8. Five uh, minutes. That you are offspring of Abraham. So he knows they're actually Jewish. And yet he's, and yet watch what he's going to say to them. He's going to talk about their father. They're like, well, Abraham's our father. He said, no, no, no. You're of your father, the devil. Yet they're, they're Jews. How, how is that possible? Because bloodline is not enough. Scripture affirms that within the larger body of Israel, there is true Israel. Look at Romans 9, 6. You have of Israel, that's the flesh, versus true Israel. You have Abraham's seed, 9, 7, versus Abraham's children or seed, which are true, according to Romans 9, 7. Reading this in the full context of Romans and, of course, Paul's other writings and the New Testament itself. You have children of the flesh versus children of the promise. The contrast is clear and plain, but let's give a few more examples. Esther 8.17, this shows that people who are not even Jews can join in the people of God. Now, the, I have a lot on this. Because of time, I'm going to have to skip some of this and go to the next biblical point, because I think it's been shown that being counted as true Israel was never strictly based on biology, but rather trusting in Yahweh's word. And yes, true faith is followed by obedience. Can't leave that out. Next biblical line of evidence is that Messiah is the ultimate fulfillment of promises made to Abraham. So when you look and see this, and I'm going to have to skip some things. Maybe you'll be able to revisit it. But in essence, we understand that Christ is the true Israel, the ultimate promised seed, reiterating Galatians 3.16. 
Notice how everything points to Christ when you read through the scripture. And I'm going to show you one example, I wish we could do more, where the biblical writers understood this. Matthew 2, 14 and 15. He rose and took the child, that's Jesus, and his mother tonight and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I have called my son. First of all, it's interesting they were leaving Israel, and yet he gives the proclamation that it's out of Egypt, and yet they don't actually leave Egypt until a number of verses later. But notice, well, who was this originally about? Go to Hosea. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. This was a looking back by the prophet Hosea upon the nation of Israel, speaking of Israel as a son in this very manner. And yet that gets applied to Jesus. If you don't understand typology, you won't understand how that's a prophecy with a fulfillment. If you do and understand the Christocentric focus of the New Testament, you will clearly see from this and other examples that you should be familiar with that Jesus is the faithful and perfect Israel, God's son. The Bible, therefore, is a story of God's work in history to sum up all things in Christ. I have a little part in covenants. I'm not going to be able to get to some of that, but I do want to read this from Ephesians 1. So you can see, this ain't crazy talk. This is Bible talk. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment. And that's what the birth of Christ. To bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. So Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of both the promises to Abraham's family and the typological patterns as seen in the history of Israel. The Messiah is the ultimate fulfillment of promises to Abraham. The fourth biblical line of evidence is that the believer in Messiah now shares in the Abrahamic promises. Therefore, the followers of Christ are the true Israelites. We shouldn't be calling people who are not faithful to God faithful to God unless they are faithful to God. And how does God define it? You have to have the trust of Abraham. So if you don't believe in Messiah, you're not a true Israelite. No matter who your father and grandfather going back thousands of years years is, it just doesn't matter, biblically speaking. Now, continuing on here, I want to show something from Galatians 6 that gives evidence to what I just said there. Far be it, Paul says, from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, notice that, nor uncircumcision, so what does count? But a new creation, same thing Jesus told Nicodemus. And as for all who walk by this rule, the rule just stated, peace and mercy be upon them uh, and upon the Israel of God. The Israel of God. This is how Paul is referring to Christians in the New Testament. And that type of thing happens all throughout the New Testament. For example, the church is seen as the bride of Christ. Think about it. Who is Jesus said to be married to, ladies and gentlemen? Ephesians 5. And all the scriptures on the screen, when you put them all together, even Old Testament pre-shadowing. The Lamb's wife is the, is, is, the, is the church. The bride of Christ. Jesus doesn't have two brides. He doesn't have two other ones. All and right, Tom, 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 brother. All right, let's go, Zion. Remove your screen. Remember, I'm a, do y'all want me to remind y'all when, when? Because I remind y'all at five minutes or what? Five minutes. Uh, I, I, I would prefer if after every five minutes passes, like after the first five, you let me know 10 minutes. Gotcha. Last five, five minutes. I want to interrupt you, or, or I can do a, um, let me see. I want to get the lowest one possible. You hear that? Yeah. It might be hard if I'm talking over it. Okay. The person that's not talking, it'd be easier for them to hear it, but the person if speaking, it'd be hard. If I do that, there you go. There okay. you go. If I do that, then you know that's um, you got 10 minutes. All right. And then the next one will be five minutes. All right, okay. it works. Okay, so Zion, load up, load up the guns, brother. Let's get it. Let's go. Load up the ammunition. You got 15 minutes in this round. The title is, Who are the biblical Israelites today? I see your, um, I see your um, screen share. There you go. Let me know when you're ready. I am ready, sir. All right. Time will start. Talk. Start talking. All right. I want to say from the outset, vocab showed up to the wrong debate. Uh, it appears as if that he acknowledges that his premises failed from the very beginning. 
because he's declining to address the issue, the topic. The topic essentially is who are the biblical Israelites today, right? The topic is not who are the biblical Israelites today from a Christological lens. The topic is not who are the biblical Israelites today from the view of the Bible alone. The topic is who are the biblical Israelites today? We're talking about history. And so he should have began with history, but I'll, I'll pick up where he should have began and I'll go into my screen share. I'm not sure how long vocab has been around doing this, but I've been around for quite some time. Uh, if you look at the paper clip, uh, it's from 1998. I'm already four years in the Israelite community by this time. This paper goes back to 26 years ago. I've been dealing with this topic of who are the biblical Israelites in history for a very, very long time. So much so that 26 years ago, uh, our local newspaper, the Third Eye News, printed in Brooklyn, New York, 297 Saratoga Avenue for Congregation Shema Israel. Um, I authored this article going into the history of European Jews. When we talk about the biblical Israelites, at times questions arise as to what they look like. Um, here's a primary image from uh, the tomb of Kunum Homtep II, not necessarily showing Israelites, but showing the look of Semites in ancient Egypt, because these are people known as the Hyksos, the Hekasut. And so we know what the Semites look like in the 15th century BCE, and they certainly didn't look like Vocab Malone, and they certainly didn't look like the people who are building uh, secret tunnels here in New York City. I'll move on. We have historical texts inside of Jewish lore. There's a text known as Perke Rabbi De Eliezer, which speaks to the color of the original biblical Israelites. And it speaks of their ancestors. It speaks of Shem, Ham, and Yapheth. And I want to read something really quick. It says in Hebrew, Barek le Shem, Levana, Shakurim, Weni'im, Weha Nachalim, Et Chol Eretz, Noshvet, Baruch Lehem, Wevana, Shakurim, Ke Urev, Weha Nachalim, Chof, Hayim, Haberek, Lehafet, Wevana. He blessed Shem, black and desirable in Hebrew, Shakurim, Shakur being the root. Shem is called black by Midrashic and Jewish sources. They acknowledge biblical Shem to be black. I have this on the screen because we should begin by acknowledging to some extent what was the look, maybe even the phenotype of the biblical Israelites. As far as we're told in modern history, the history of the Jews in Europe spans a period of over 2,000 years. Jews is an, are, an, are considered an Israelite tribe from Judea in the Levant, and they began migrating to Europe just before the rise of the Roman Empire in 27 before the Common Era. Although Alexandrian Jews had already migrated to Rome, a notable early event in the history of the Jews in the Roman Empire was the 63 BCE siege of Jerusalem. And so the idea presented by most is that the reason why we find European Jewry today is after 70 AD, the majority of Jews fled into Europe. And we're going to challenge much of those claims today, and we're going to address what's right from what's wrong. This is a map, if everyone can really just blow up your screen for a moment, even if you need to take away the, com the uh, comment section, because I want to make sure that everyone is able to follow this. This is a map of what's called the early Jewish diaspora until the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. If you focus on the map, you can quite literally see that Jews have been entering heartland Africa since the fifth century BCE, attested to by historians. Right here where my arrow is hovering, it says, according to Philo of Alexandria, in the first century AD, Jews in Egypt numbered one million. That's Africa, right? 12% of the total population, including 200,000 in Alexandria, Egypt alone. So what this map shows us is how long Jews have been in heartland Africa and to what extent they travel towards Europe. If you focus very clearly on the map, the only parts of Europe acknowledged that Jews travel to are parts of Rome, otherwise known as Italy, parts of Greece, 
the port parts mentioned in the New Testament. And of course, as we already know, parts of Asia Minor and Mesopotamia. But there are no attestations from the first, second centuries BCE, third BCE, fourth BCE, none BCE of any Israelite or even what scholars call Jewish settlements in uh, Europe, as it were. You only begin to see settlements around the second century BCE, and that occurs with Greece, followed by Rome. Thank you. In this other map, you can actually see the routes a little bit more clearly. So what historians acknowledge is that Israelites have a pattern of exile and a pattern of escape. When Israelites needed to escape persecution, when Israelites needed to avoid famine, they have a history of going into Africa, namely Egypt. You don't see Israelites traveling to parts of Europe, any part of Europe, for a famine. You don't see Israelites in historical biblical times traveling into Europe. The only times you begin to see that, again, is with the onset of the Greek kingdom. But as you can see, there are major Israelite settlements all, all throughout Africa long before we begin to see what's considered today European Jewry. This map. I wanted to hold towards the end, but vocab kind of made it a little easy, so I'll show it now. Um, this map shows the migration pattern of Jews leaving Spain and Portugal from what's called the Alhambra Decree. In 1492, Spain issues that which is known as the uh, Alhambra Decree. The Alhambra Decree is the forced expulsion of Jews out of Spain. It was followed five years later by the forced expulsion of Jews out of Portugal. If you literally trace the arrows, you literally see Jews leaving Spain and Portugal and coming into Africa in 1492. In 1497, you see a small pocket of Jews leaving Portugal and going to Holland. But the primary route, the main route that Jews are keeping in fleeing Spain and Portugal is to go into continental Africa, something they've had a history of doing even since biblical days. Joseph coming down into Egypt, Abraham going into Egypt, Jacob going into Egypt. I'll continue. There are a number of historical scholars that speak towards these things. I'm going to bring us back to this part at the very end because I want to acknowledge something really quick. The earliest settlement of Jews in Germany, or what's called the Rhineland, occurs in about 321 CE. That's the earliest settlement of Jews in a region that will later be considered the foundational hallmark of where Ashkenazic Jewry begins. The city is called Cologne and it is known historically as Cologne on the Rhine. The history of the Jews in Cologne dates to 321 CE when it was recorded in a census decreed by the Emperor Constantine. As such, it is the oldest European Jewish community north of the Alps. The community quickly established itself in what came to be known as Cologne's Jewish quarters, building its very first synagogue in 1000 or 1040 Common Era. Just so we're clear, Israelites are building synagogues in Africa literally 1500 years before that, because you have a temple built in Elephantine in Egypt by Israelites, where they're reported and documented as celebrating Passover. So long before you see synagogues are appearing in uh, Europe, you already have not only synagogues in heartland continental Africa, but you even have a temple. It's known as the Elephantine Temple. In a work known as Kitab al Buldan, by the way, when we're talking about history and we're placing a people in a historical context, you usually want to come with sources that are dealing in history. So I'm a person that follows the Bible, but I'm intelligent enough to know when to introduce the Bible and when to look at history, because at times the two can be misconstrued. According to Arab geographer Abu Abbas al yakubi he wrote about a kingdom of converted Jews called the Khazars between the Black and Caspian Seas. This is page 121. The birth is known as Kitab al Budan. I'll continue. In a work known as the Kuzari, by the way, the text I'm going to be quoting from, I have here in my library 
are on hand, ready to show. A text known as the Kuzari, also known as the Khazar Correspondence, is a historical account detailing the conversion of European Jews, who later come to be known as Ashkenazic Jews. I think it's extremely important to point out at this point that this work was produced by a Jew. His name is Rabbi, not just a Jew, a rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. The name of the work is the Kuzari, which is how you say Khazar in Hebrew. And the work deals with detailing the account of how the Europeans came into conversion as Jews. Another work that is a little bit more popularly known is Arthur Kostler's 13th Tribe, which documents the history of the Khazars in European Jewry. Through research and study, it may just be the biggest hoax played out in modern history yet. This is actually from the foreword in the book. The foreword in the book says the history of the Khazars and European Jewry through research and study may just be the biggest hoax played out in modern history yet. By the way, Arthur Kostler is himself a European Ashkenazic Jew. Shalom Osen, current Israeli Tel Aviv University professor, as in current professor teaching at Israeli University, Tel Aviv University. He says in his book, The Invention of the Jewish People, Israeli historian and Tel Aviv University professor Shalom Osen argues in his book that most modern Jews descended from converts. I'll continue. In Codex Judaica, I'm not sure who vocab is used to having discussions with, but uh, I'm used to having real sources. In Codex Judaica, a book that I'm actually holding in my hand, but Sonetta doesn't have my screen showed up so you can't see. But in Codex Judaica, European Jews acknowledge the Khazar conversion. They even acknowledge the year. It says in Codex Judaica on page 167, the Khazars, a people said to originate from the vicinity of Turkey, lived at this time in a region between the Black and Caspian Sea. Their king and many of his people converted to Judaism. In that same book on page 175, the author of the Kuzari, whose name is Kizdai ibn Shaprut, he's the one in the Kuzari that's writing letters of dialogue between a Khazar king. It says, Kasdai ibn Sharut, who some say sent letters to Joseph, the Jewish king of the Khazars, 740 AD. Why am I pointing this out? A lot of times when we're having this conversation about who the Jews are, a lot of people like to begin where it makes sense by talking about who the Jews are not, because a lot of people have an already formed opinion about who these Jews are. So we have to challenge that. And so that's what I'm doing. Codex Judaica, which is the chronological index of Jewish history, acknowledges the Khazar conversion. It even acknowledges the date 740. What this work really speaks of, and this is extremely important, in this exchange in the Kuzari, <clears throat> Rabbi Yehuda Halevi documents that when Ibn Sharut talks to Eastern European Jews, he is surprised because he had never heard of there being any Jews beyond Italy, Greece, and Spain and Portugal, Africa, Israel, and Babylon. No one had ever heard of European Jews at that time. By the, year, by the way, it's the 10th century, the 900s. In Tami 32a, in the oral tradition, it says, when Alexander was preparing to, to uh, part from the elders of the Negev, he said to them, I want to go out to wage war against the country of Africa, called in Hebrew, Afriki. Now, I only have this on the screen to show you that the term Afriki in Jewish literature denotes Africa. But the next screen is what I really want to show you. In the Babylonian Talmud, in Sanhedrin 94a, Marzutra, a Babylonian Talmudic scholar says, to where did Sennacherib exile the 10 tribes? Marzutra said, Afriki, Africa. That's in Jewish literature. 
In a work entitled Hebrewisms of West Africa, it says on page 169, in 70 AD, large numbers of Jews fled or drifted into Ethiopia, otherwise known as Africa at the time, Abyssinia and neighboring territories. In a work known as North Africa produced by the United States Defense Department, Department of Defense, what a lot of people don't know is that the United States Department of Defense actually has historical works. Being that I'm a museum tour guide and I, I'm always in the museums, when you go in the bookshops of the museums, you see many works produced by the United States Department of Defense that are just dealing exclusively with history. So in the United States Department of Fence, Defense, they have a book on North Africa. And look at what it says on page 17. The Jews began fil filtering into the Mediterranean coastal cities before the Roman conquest of North Africa. After Roman Emperor Titus captured Jerusalem in 70 AD, many more fled into North Africa. Africa. So there's this myth that 90% of the Jews went into Europe when all of the historical sources are saying the majority of the Jews fled into Africa. So why is it today that Ashkenazic Jews who are considered 95% of world Jewry, how is it possible when they originate from a region where there's converts? All right, there it is. That's the time. That's your time there. We're going into the second round, which you have 10 minutes, powerful response, powerful opening by vocab, powerful response by Zion the Lion. I just learned something just now, man, when he talked about Afrique. Afrique in Hebrew means Afrique or something like that, because we've been saying that for a long time in Africa. So what I'm going to do is we got Zion up Next, I mean, um, vocab up next with 10 minutes. Begin when you're ready. Sonata, can you share the slides? Thank you. Your slides is up. Let me know when you're ready. All right. Zion says he wants some sources outside of the Bible, even though Bible is literally in today's title, and I'll gladly supply him with that. I have. Are you ready? Yes, I am. I Time got it prepared stop. already. He showed this image. Now I'm going to show the actual inscription. This is usually how it's uh, sort of colored in, but you'll see that it matches with what's underneath. Yeah, the Semitic traders there uh, labeled as Hyskos, and this is a mural on Tomb Three at Beni Hassam. And it's important to notice that the Egyptians portray themselves as well as the Semites. Notice the color of the Egyptians versus the color of the Semites. They are not the same. Now, here's what it actually looks like. You can see the same reality. They're using two different pigmentations. Unless my eyes were deceiving me, when Zion Lex showed this image to you, he cut it off before it showed the Egyptian figure. He only showed the Semitic figures, so you had no way to compare and contrast. Why did he do that? That doesn't seem like an honest way to argue, but I have more archaeology for him. What did Nubians look like, according to Egyptians? Because we've seen Semites. Let's take a look. The source is on the screen. Like that. Did, did the Semites we just saw, did they, did they look like this? Look closely, ladies and gentlemen. Look very closely. These are Nubian slaves underneath the feet of Ramses II. They do not look like the Semites he showed out of context because he didn't show you anything else. But I've got some more. I am not here today to go to bat for European Jews. But since Zion Lex wants to talk about it, we can ask the question, was there a diaspora to Europe? I don't know who he's thinking of that says 90% of the folks who fled went into Europe. I, I don't know who says that. I've never said that. But since he's asking, it's prophesied and predicted even in the Old Testament. You have in Joel 3, 4 through 8, a Greek slave trade mentioned. Sometimes you'll see the word Javan there. But here it's translated right there. You have sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks in order to remove them far from their own border. 
It already even started in the Old Testament. Like I said, my case is built upon who has the faith of Abraham. But if he wants to go this route, we can go this route and show he is simply incorrect. In fact, the, pro the prophecy of Daniel contains the kingdoms of Greece and Rome proph prophesied clearly. These are European kingdoms. And if you listen to Zion Lex, he believes that a good proof for why he is actually a descendant of Abraham is because he says, if you notice, the big empires always sweep up our people. And that's one way you know. Well, if that's the case, and, and, and he says, that's where we go. If that's the case, well, then you're going to go into Greece and Rome. It's prophesied right there in Daniel. Europe is mentioned in the Bible. So I don't know who these people he's quoting to say they never heard of European Jews. What's he talking about? Had they never read the book of Romans, the book of Corinthians? Didn't they read about Paul and Malta? Didn't they read about Greece and Macedonia? Didn't they see Philippians? Didn't they read Thessaloniki? Didn't they see Paul in Athens with Jews there? Didn't they see Titus on Crete? Didn't they see the letters to the church at Galatia, which had Jews? Didn't they see Dalmatia, Ilcrium, Acts 2, 9, 11, which mentions people from all over, plus things in the Apocrypha? Didn't they even see in Isaiah 66 when you have a return, they're coming out of Javan to the coastlands far away. Well, that's Greece. So I am a little perplexed by some of what he said there. But let me share a couple of other things that I think will help answer some of the things that were just said to us. And I'm not against Zion. I hope that he continues his journey with the Messiah that he has started in the past five years. But that's something very important. Zion Lex showed us a newspaper image from 1998 and was proud that he had written this article at 26, 26 years ago. With all due respect, you've been studying this Bible that whole time. And for 25 years, you've been wrong about the most important prediction in the Old Testament, who the Messiah is. I don't think it makes sense to go around trumpeting when you were unaware, denying Jesus as the Messiah for two decades and a half and missing the main prophecy that's sitting right there in front of your face. Now, I don't want to go too hard on that because I want to encourage you to continue in your journey, but I don't think it's a point of bragging. I think it's something like Paul said in Philippians 3, it should be a point that you say, this is scubalon. I count those things as worthless because you were on the wrong track. You missed the big picture. You had a blindness. And I feel like if I was wrong about something that important for 25 years, I would step to the stage with just a little bit of humility when we, when we deal with these issues. Frankly, that's what I'm hoping for here tonight. He said something strange. He said, well, hey, uh, you know, this isn't a Christological lens. This isn't a Christological lens that we're talking about here. Not a Christological lens. Let me share my slide again here. I, I, I'm very confused why he would say that when we come to this issue. This certainly should be viewed through a Christological lens. Why do I say that? Because that's the way Jesus interpreted Scripture. Don't we want to interpret Scripture the way Jesus interpreted Scripture? I know that I do. Can I show you, ladies and gentlemen, the way Jesus and his Spirit-led disciples interpreted Scripture? And I would hope that if you are a true disciple of Jesus, you'll do the same thing. Jesus is the interpretive key. And look at this. He has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. The scripture says in Hebrews, Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. The references on the screen, the greatest prophet of Judaism points to someone else. Jesus, the authoritative prophet. God has revealed himself over time and his revelation has come to a climax in Jesus Christ. Now all previous revelation must be understood in light of this centrality. That's from a book called What is New Covenant Theology? But let's show where the Bible says what I just said out of that book. This is Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, why are these the last days if it's been 2,000 years? Because the coming of Christ upon the scene marks the final stage in God's plan of redemption for for his people, who, by the way, are reckoned by their faith, not by their bloodline. Now he has spoken, the scripture says, to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. We must read the Old Testament storyline like 
the Spirit-led apostles like Jesus did. I'm going to show you a few more places where you can see how they interpret the Scripture in a way that's Christocentric. And Zion Lex should do the same thing. That was a weird thing to me that he said, not through a Christocentric lens. 1 Corinthians 2.2 says something different. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what Paul says. And yet Paul also said in Acts 20, 27, I did not shrink from declaring you the whole counsel of God. Now, how can you put those two things together unless the scripture speaks to Jesus? And indeed, Luke 24, 27 and 44 show Jesus beginning with Moses and all the prophets and the Psalms interpreting the things concerning himself. So if we're not interpreting scripture in a Christocentric way, guess what? We're not doing it like the Messiah, because that's not the only time Jesus showed that he is indeed the center, the crux, the epicenter of the Bible itself. John 5, 39 through 40. This goes to everyone who yet denies Christ. You search the scriptures because you think that in him you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Now, notice this. He makes acceptance of his claims the way to gain eternal life. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Why should we listen to Jesus though? Because this is who he is. In Acts 3, they speak back on what Moses said in Deuteronomy 18. And here's what's said. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you. No exceptions. He is in charge. He is the boss. This is the way we should be interpreting scripture. Don't we see that? So a big part of this debate really is not about just some historical claim, which, by the way, again, I emphasize to you, the title of the debate literally has biblical in it. It's also about biblical interpretation. But let's go to the history for a second here. He said, well, look, he showed a picture. He said, look, Shem is black. Well, so was Ham on that slide. So how do you know who's who? That's what I want to know, Zylex, because you showed two guys, and it wasn't a white dude and a black dude. Shim and him. Both. So tell me how to discern. Is it by DNA? How, how is it that you make the distinction? How you know thousands of years after those two men existed, who's who? I want to know this. If you waste time with genealogy, that's important. He says that a, 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 is that 15 or is that 10? That's 10. Okay. okay. And this I want to do the 15 is up to Zion. I'm good there. I'll answer the other stuff later. I'm good. All right, man. Powerful, powerful, man. Come back. We got 10 minutes for Zion Lex in this second round. Time will start when he's ready. Let's put your PowerPoint up. Let's get it together. Awesome debate, brothers. Awesome debate between both of y'all. Awesome debate. The people are loving it. We got 957 people in the audience watching, and they are loving every minute of it. The comments is going crazy. Let's go. Let's go whenever you're ready, brother. Remember now, right after this round, y'all got 10 minutes um, to engage cross-examination with each other, one minute to answer each other. So this is going to be a fire round coming up. Zion, time will start when you're ready, brother. Let me unmute you. Unmute you. Unmute your mic, Zion. Okay, I'm go. ready. My my screen is shared. Can I can I begin? Okay, so I I didn't know I didn't think that vocab would lie, but I mean everything is recorded. So I I just want to revisit something really quick because um apparently I have enough time to do so. Okay. Vocab says that Zion doesn't acknowledge that um Italy, uh Thessalonia, Greece are parts of Europe. I literally said that to the extent that it's actually on my PowerPoint slide. But apparently he wasn't doing enough listening. And again, he showed up to the wrong uh, presentation. So I, I certainly said that beyond Greece, beyond Italy or Rome, and beyond the places mentioned in the New Testament, such as Thessalonia, Antioch, I'll even extend now, beyond those places, no part of Europe is ever mentioned. I certainly said that. Apparently vocab has selective hearing, but I'll, I'll move on. Mm -hmm. Just get back to where I was. I'm going to pause your time. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. This is where I want to be. Time, time resume. Thank you, sir. 
So according to historian Josephus, 100,000 Jews fled from Israel into Africa in the third century BCE. This is from the Jewish historian Josephus. This is documented in Against Appion 1144. Philo lived in 40 BC to 40 AD and also says over 1 million Jews lived in Libya and Egypt during his lifetime. Strabo said, it's hard to find a place in a habitable world that has not admitted this tribe of men. Notice the key statement, the habitable world, right? Because we know that places in far Eastern Europe are not accounted for in the history of, of that region at that time. No one had any interaction with them. So that's pivotal to point out when he says the habitable world. Abraham Ibn Ezra wrote that Tafilat in Morocco was a great city of sages and geonim. Morocco is in Africa. The term geonim refers to a particular class of rabbis. You had rabbis in Africa, from North Africa to West Africa? You sure did. Traveling historians and ethnologists document the presence of black Jews in Africa. Eldad the Danite from 851 and 900 CD, uh, Benjamin of Toledo, Arab tra travelers, Tariq al-Fatash, al-Bakari, West Africa, 1067 CE, Leo Africanus, the Jews of Bilal al-Sudan. The documented presence of black Jews in West Africa and the Congo during the slave trade by Conrad Malt Brun. Two French travelers from the 18th century, Conrad and James, traveled around Africa during the time, this is important, of the slave trade and documented the tribes in Africa. While traveling through the kingdom of Luango, which is present day Congo, they came across black Jews. In their book, A System of Universal Geography or a Description of All Parts of the World, they wrote, the kingdom of Lugano contains black Jews scattered throughout the country. They are despised by the Negroes who do not even design to eat with them. They are occupied in trade and keep the Sabbath so strictly that they do not even converse on that day. They have a separate burying ground, very far from any habitation. The tombs are constructed with masonry and ornamented with Hebrew inscriptions. In a work known as The Life of Oludo Equiano, a kidnapped and enslaved prince, Oludo Equiano, stolen from Nigeria, belonging to the Igbo tribe of Nigeria. We know about his account. His account is that he was kidnapped and enslaved, taken from Igbo land in Nigeria and brought over through the transatlantic slave trade. His story is, his story is world renowned. And what's significant about his story is he is an eyewitness account, an Israelite literally boarding the slave ships that came off the slave ship acknowledging that he's an Israelite. A letter sent by the elders and rabbis of the Ashkenazi community. Now, this is an important citation that I'm about to go into. This is a letter known as the Letter to the Ten Lost Tribes by the Vilna Gaon. Some of you may remember or know of Harry Rosenberg. Harry Rosenberg is a descendant of a person renowned in the European uh, Jewish world. His name is the Vilna Gaon. His students sent a letter to the Ten Lost Tribes in Israel. And look at where they say the 10 lost tribes in Israel are, who dwell beyond the rivers of Nubia, Cush, that would be Africa, right, everybody? With the tribes of Dan, which Ethiopian Jews are considered to be, Naphtali, which are Ghanaian Jews are considered to be, Gad, which you find Igbo uh, Israelites are considered to be, as well as Asher and Isaskar. Now I'm going to, Sonnet, I'm going to need you to switch my screen over real quick. Because I just want to show that part on the big screen for everybody. So if you're there, Sonny, to please stop my time. Yeah, Thomas. To... Thank you, sir. I want to be able to show that on the big screen real quick. And while we're doing that, I'm going to hit you with this. You got five minutes left. Okay. I got you. Your screen is up. All right. Let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. Tom Rizzo. So this is a letter. Thank oh. Tom um, so this is a letter uh, by the students of the Vilna Gaon to the ten lost tribes of Israel, which are in Africa, by the way, but you'll see everybody. 
Moses, which is a gift and inherited portion to our brothers, the children of Israel, the son of Iskot, the son of Abraham, who revealed the belief in Hashem. They are our holy and pure brothers, the righteous upon whom the world rests. B'nai Moshe, servants of Hashem, who dwell across the river Shevaton, also known as Sembation, and who plans an allegiance to the king, the king of Israel, who sits upon a mighty throne and who rules over the 10 tribes. Where are the 10 tribes? Whose settlement is in the land beyond the rivers of Nubia. Push, who camp according to their banners, the tribe of Dan, Naphtali, and Gad. So I just wanted to show that source. So I wanted to please stop my screen because I need to get back to my original PowerPoint. That's the last time I'll be doing that. You mean stop your time? I got it. Uh, <laughs> my, my apologies. My apologies. I got you, brother. Go ahead. Time stop. You got 417 left. Four minutes, 17 okay. seconds. As you can see, there's a continuation from Israelites who are coming off the slave ships. What can sometimes be referred to as the holiness movement, and I think vocab is especially known to have these discussions, early groups in the Americas, North America to be exact, that speak about having um, a blood relationship to the biblical Israelites uh, of biblical times began with what's, what's called holiness movements, which were black churches all throughout America where their pastors, their leaders, their ministers spoke messages and 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 um <clears throat> and sermons relegating or excuse me identifying with being the israelites of the bible from this movement you get a rabbi known as chief rabbi arthur wentworth matthew he dates back to 1919 when he founded the commandment keepers here in harlem new york he was preceded by rabbi arnold jo uh, josiah ford who was the musical director of the UNIA, founded the Beit B'nai Abraham in 1923. He's an ordained rabbi, immigrated to Ethiopia. There's a, there's a lot that I can say, but because of time constraint, I'm going to move on. This is a map of black synagogues in Africa today. And I think that's important to point out. And uh, an I want to play this video. Son of this video can be played because I'm the owner of this content. Anybody that shares this content on social media, yeah. Sonetta, YouTube tells me, and I have the I have the um the right to flag their video, so I can play this video. I'm the owner yeah. of it. All right, yeah. just so yeah. you know. All right. Entity for themselves because they were slaves, or is there really something here? And the answer is most likely there is something there, and most likely maybe that they were the original Israelites, and maybe that the Jewish people today, who are white Caucasian people, um, came in. All right, just give me a second, Sonata. That didn't play at the right spot, so just give me a second. You got to let me know to stop your time, brother. Yeah, that's why, that's why I was saying, wait a second. Same for you, Vocab. If there's any reason you need me to stop your time, you got to let me know. That didn't stop at the right place, so just give me a second. Okay. Okay. Another area All in right. Africa where we have uh, something big happening is in Nigeria. You have the Igbo people, or Igbo, pronounced either way. There's 40 million of them, also Christians. Like I spoke about before, how that could happen to the children of Israel very easily. But also, a lot of them are now coming out and converting back or adopting the, the rules of the Torah without all the paganism that they've been practicing for hundreds of years. There's been books written about it from scholars in Nigeria, from scholars from the Jewish people. And where it gets interesting is in America, there was a slave trade. And a lot of the slaves, a very high percentage of them, came from Western Nigerian ports. And in America today, you see a, a very large movement of African Americans who say that they're the real chosen people, that they're the children of Israel, they're the Judeans. You know, so what are they just trying to create a, an identity for themselves because they were slaves, or is there really something here? And the answer is most likely there is something there, and most likely maybe that they were the original Israelites, and maybe that the Jewish people today, who are white Caucasian people, um, came in a little bit later on. 
We know that some of the greatest sages of the transmission of the Torah were converts from Rome. You have a man named Uncleus who, who wrote a commentary on the Torah, unprecedented, that we still learn today. He was a convert. Some of the, the largest pillars on the transmission today were Roman converts. So here we are, we're, you know, I'm speaking, we're Caucasian Jewish people. And now you have people in Africa saying that they're the real people of Israel. It can't be ruled out at all. We know they were sold into slavery. We know now that they're fulfilling prophecies by saying, we're coming back. We want to rejoin the nation. All right, I'm going to stop right there. And I'm going to say this as my closing remark. So I can, all right, I'm going to say this as my closing remark. Hopefully I got a little bit more time. Um, what I showed is that European Jews don't exist uh, before 740 CE. Uh, if we are to consider Greeks um, and Romans, uh, Jews or Israelites that come in there, that's a different scenario because they're not accounted as being what we call Ashkenazic Jewry. And again, Ashkenazic Jewry is said to make up at least 92 to 98 percent of world Jewry. Jews that live in places like France, Italy, Greece, North Africa, they're all considered Sephardic, not Ashkenazic. So I'm not the Israelite that says an Israelite has to be of a black skin and hue because a person could be genetically African and phenotypically European. So I have enough common sense to understand that. But I still want to get the story straight. All right. You can get it straight because we got we up to the part where you cross examine each other and each of you have 10 minutes apiece to question each other. You have one minute to ask, to answer your question. Your one minute starts when the person finished answering the question. Um, Voktab, um, you go first in this round. You got 10 minutes and you will be cross-examining our brother Zion. You got 10 minutes. He got one minute to answer the question. Y'all got it? Yes. Clear as day. Is there any questions? I think, yeah, I think we got it all. Okay. Um, time will start when you're ready, vocab. Right. Zion Lexan, your book, The Star of David Controversy, you talk about the Masoretic scribes who precede the conversion of European Jewry. Well, the Masoretes flourished into the 10th century. That's in 900s. And yet you just said that there's this mass conversion of European Jewry in, this, in 740. Do you believe that the Masoretes were European converts? I'm trying to help. I'm trying to understand when you believe this mass conversion happened. All right. So if that's your question, I'll answer a very easy question, a little silly, but I'll address it. So the term Masorite comes to the term Mesorah, a Hebrew term. It's actually used in the Hebrew Bible, by the way. But vocab doesn't read nor speak Hebrew, so he wouldn't know that. Um, the Masorites are not a converted group. They're part of the rabbinical era. There are no European Jews during what's called the Gaonic period, which is where you have the beginning of the Masoretic scribes. But because he doesn't know that, because he doesn't study the history, he would ha not have a way to answer that. So the Masoretic scribes originate from what's called the Gaonic period, right? Which is from the fifth to the seventh centuries common era. You don't have European Jews before that time in history. So they're not a converted group. And by the way, the topic of the debate is who are the biblical Israelites today, not Zion Lex. What did you say about your book, Star of David Controversy? It is relevant. I'm certainly going to quote your books. This is standard practice in debates, Zion Lex. It's relevant because it's relevant to some of the claims you've made tonight. And I'm going to do it again. In it was written and engraved. Towards the back here, you do Gematria with the name of the good ship Jesus, saying that it's numerically equivalent to 613. Zion Lex, are you aware that the name of the ship was not actually the good ship Jesus? It was the Jesus of Lubeck? I'm very aware of that. And not only am I aware of that, I wrote about this. So the term Jesus of Lubeck was still referred to as the good ship Jesus. So what's important here is that the ship of Lubeck came to be known as the good ship Jesus. But more importantly, what you're not pointing out, and thank you for um, pointing out my book, is that the term Yeshua Sefina 
or the term Yeshua told Sefina, the good ship Jesus has a numerical value of 613, which is ironic because the Torah states that the Israelites went into captivity because they did not keep the commandments. But by the way, because we're having a historical conversation tonight and we're not talking about exegetical mysticism, I haven't talked about gematria. So once again, vocab is fishing for a way out because he fails to want to deal with history today, but I'll, I'll, I'll allow him to continue doing whatever he's trying to do. Yeah, if you're going to answer your questions like that, I'm going to answer my question similar because I'm just asking you to ask the question, uh, but you're doing a lot more than that. Hey, can, am I, can I be on the screen, Zion? Uh, uh, Zion Dada? Okay. I, I don't have control over who's on the screen. No, no, I, I'm saying with you is what I was trying to say. Okay, uh, you talked a lot about who are not the Jews. That was very important to you. Do you also deny that uh, most Mexican Americans are they Israelites? Since I haven't, I haven't Jews? studied that claim invasively. I do believe that there are studies that show that there's an Israelite presence uh, prior to uh, what's documented as the transatlantic slave trade. But I haven't studied that area extensively to speak towards that. Uh, I am not part of the groups that that accept some of those larger areas of of, of ideology. So, and I'm sure you, by the way, you know this. So I, yes. I'm, I'm guessing, I'm not finished answering, by the way. So I'm guessing what you're trying to do once again is fish for a way of trying to divide and conquer among the Israelite group for me to condemn their views publicly. So I'm just going to simply say that I haven't delved into those areas. Yeah, again, well, I'm you, should do, you, you, should, to you, should, you should probably do some research on that. And you yourself criticize One West groups. You yourself frequently tell them that they're caught up in juvenile matters, that they have need to have deeper conversations, that they're immature. So this is something you do on your channel. So, you know, you're trying to win points with your audience by doing that. But this is something you yourself could do. You're highly critical of the groups, except in certain situations like now. But you don't agree with them, especially on things like Lashwan Kodash. So I don't know. Let's just be straight here. Now, you say that the transatlantic slave trade is encoded within the Torah. And you use Gematria to get that. Zion Lex, who was the first person that you're aware of that ever saw this code? All right. So just to be clear, I did not speak about any of that this evening. So once again, Vocab does not wish to talk about the topic. The topic is who are the biblical Israelites today? Vocab has no historicity to enter the discussion. That's why he'd rather talk about things that are completely off topic. So I'm not going to buy into that because I stay on topic. So what I'm simply going to say is next question, sir. I'm going to okay. ask you questions that are on topic. Yeah, well, Zion Lex, let me explain to you. You can waste uh, your question, Ralph. Let, let me explain to you the way things work. It's, this is shocking that you don't understand this. Number one, it's common to read people's support that they give for their position in their works. I have done so. So you're pulling the, oh, well, I didn't talk about it tonight. That's somebody who doesn't want to defend their written work. Stand on your square. If you're willing to write it, you should be willing to talk about it and defend it, number one. Number two, Zion Lex, it's part of your support for why you think you're an Israelite, which you have literally done nothing to show here tonight other than talk about why people aren't. So within that, you also write that your catchphrase is definitions bring us to a place of discernment. How do you define a biblical Israelite? A biblical Israelite is first and foremost one who was a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay. How do you determine who is a biblical Israelite? By the methods through which I just showed you, you can even add methods such as DNA, which DNA is also present in the studies that ascertain the Israelite nature of Israelites throughout Africa, as well as Israelites in America. I actually did my DNA. I shared the results live on my YouTube channel, and my DNA shows markers all throughout the Middle East connected to Ethiopian Jewry as well. Hmm. You say now that Jesus is the Messiah, and this is important because this is the promise given to Israel. <laughs> this is the promise given to Israel, right? And you say you're a disciple of Messiah. So Moses said that you need to do whatever Jesus commanded you to do. So have you been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And if so, where? Okay, so that would be a great question to ask under a different topic. So I'm going to say next topic, sir. I do not have to answer any question during the debate, I will answer a question that is on topic to the debate. I'm an author of eight books on several different topics. If you're debating me on one topic, I'll address any topic. 
But if you're going to talk about several topics, you need to find another debate. But I'll tell the community what he's attempting to do. He understands expertly that there are several doctrines that divide and polarize the Israelite community. So if you notice, he's been fishing it with his question by pulling out doctrinal differences that polarize the community because he's desperate to have somebody on his side, but nobody wants to be with a loser. Okay, Zion Lex. Uh, the reason why this question makes sense to ask you is because you say you're a true Israelite. But if you haven't done what Messiah said, Zion Lex, you're not a true Israelite. So the fact that you can't see that you don't understand how it's relevant really speaks to your lack of theological understanding. It doesn't pose a problem for my question. It poses a problem for your understanding, Zion Lex. You have not been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Spirit. Otherwise, you would just answer directly. Otherwise, you would just answer it directly instead of being so evasive here tonight. And what it shows is that you're not a true disciple. That's the point. Zion Lex, are you 100% positive that you are a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Absolutely. My DNA connects to it. That's why I'm 100% positive. Okay. Do you have the DNA of Abraham by which to test this by? I do not need the DNA of Abraham. All I need is the DNA of the peoples who descend from Abraham and the surrounding regions. So that is my answer, sir. Well, that begs the question. You'd have to know who descends from Abraham, first of all. And, and that was the bulk of my demonstration to show that. So it's mainly based upon DNA that you know you're an Israelite? No, there are many other methods that I know that I'm an Israelite, that I ascertain what an Israelite is. As I said to you, even before this discussion began, we're forced to truncate information in this dialogue, even though we both recognize that because of the nature of the dialogue, it should be a larger uh, span to, in order to have this discussion. So there are many different methods. There's linguistics, there's cultural, by the way, I have all of those things ready. That's actually what I'm going to point out to you when I start my questioning, because I have four more PowerPoints ready. Okay. Uh, Israel's been in numerous captivities, Egyptian, Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, Greece, Roman, etc. And you would say transatlantic as well. During any of those previous captivities, did they forget their identity, who they were? Or is it just in the transatlantic slave trade that they forgot? Uh, in the previous Galut or the exiles that the Israelites have been through, it would have been impossible for them to have uh, forgotten their exile or, or their identity. During those exiles, they were always addressed as such as who they are. During all of those exiles, they were persecuted for following their uh, spiritual views and their religious system. So the question automatically is a nonsensical question, because if anyone is familiar with the Babylonian captivity, there are argues that ensue among the Babylonian captivity about Israelite practices, such as Daniel refusing to eat the king's meat because of his Israelite nature. When you go into the Persian captivity, there are also items where Israelites are arguing about following the gods of the Persians, such as Esther. So there was no, um, there was no room, as it were, or space for them to forget their identity because the captivities that they were in continually reminded them of their identity. So again, it's a nonsensical question, but okay. I so guess. Did that, what I'm showing is your special pleading. So again, Zion Lex, I, I think that some basic understanding with laws of logic. By the way, sorry, it's not ten minutes yet. Would be helpful for you. Because what we have in this situation is I'm asking you that to so you can be consistent. Yeah. All figure. right. Time <laughs> is up. Okay. I gave you a little run, but time is up, brother. Oh, man. You know what? I like this, man. I like this um, examination <laughs> round. And we're going to get right back to the uh, third round right after this. Zion, you have 10 minutes in your cross-examination. Vocab, you have one minute to answer the question. I like this shit. This is vocab came with some good questions too. I love it. Go ahead. Let's go, Zion. Okay, vocab. Uh, who are the historical Israelites today uh, based on history? The historical Israelites of the day. Um, they're mixed among the nations, but there's a small sort of physical remnant left within modern day Jewry. What is modern day Jewry? What do you mean? It's composed of, composed of multiple parts. You're focused and obsessed, it seems, with Ashkenazim, but of course you know that Sephardic exists. You did mention them. Of course, there's the Mizraim who stayed close by and never really left anywhere. In fact, there's continuity from these communities all the way back from Persian and Babylonian captivities. And so they're in the area that some people call the Middle East. I prefer South uh, Southwest Asia, I think is better to say. And so that's the groups I'm talking about. But of course... Titus 3.9 tells me not to be obsessed with genealogies. 
All right, great. So we're clear that he doesn't know, based on his answer, who are the biblical Israelites today. He ran around the question and then found himself back in the corner, and he says, well, they exist in small pockets among modern Jewry, a very vague and general term. So he doesn't know. But what I want everybody to be reminded of, when he's on these street corners battling Israelites, and many of them are newly come Israelites that don't really study as much, uh, he's going into a lot of history, but he's failed to do that tonight because I'm sure he understands who he's talking to. So my second question to you is this. Um, what historical sources have you looked at um, to consider there being an uh, African um, Israelites? What historical sources have you looked at? A few things. One is, uh, that was slick. You asked me who were the historical Israelites. And then at the end, when you summarized it just now, you said, he said, biblical Israelites. You didn't ask me about biblical Israelites. You asked me about historical Israelites. These are two different categories. Number, number, uh, in the Not the person who didn't address uh, the topic all night. Changing yeah, it. well, you you got to keep it consistent. <laughs> if you're talking historical, then keep it historical, not biblical. Uh, for example, I have Equiano's biography, for example, and he's a Calvinist Christian like me. He's not someone like you who rejected Jesus for most of his adult life and just now caught on. This is a good book. He doesn't identify the way you do because he knows what's important, and it's faith in Christ. That's first and foremost. I have some of the books you've mentioned, as well as a number of others, back on the shelf. I've talked about the fact that the Limba give the goods. Uh, well, specifically, the Buba clan within, especially the priestly class, male Limba, especially. And they match up with modern day Jewry. And that's why I said mixed among the nation and small genetic remnants. This is just a fact. And if you're going to do, do, do the DNA for one, for example, the Limba, then you've also got to say, well, some of the Ashkenazi. You're past 60 some seconds. Of the I know that as well. fact. You got to have you're it all. All right, Tom, Tom. All right. So if you can, because I know I tried. Keep it to 60 seconds. We'd all appreciate that. I follow yep. the rules. You should be able to follow the rules too. Um, my, my third question to you is this. Um, in looking at what is considered today West African Jewry and the presence of Africans, um, excuse me, the presence of Jews in Africa versus the presence of Europe, I want to ask you a question. Can you contrast for uh, us the, the length of difference between the historical presence of Jews in Africa versus the historical presence of Jews in Europe and quantify for us who has a longer documented presence throughout Africa versus Europe. Jews have been in North Africa longer than Europe, but they've been in Europe longer than West Africa. It's not all the same. I imagine you know that. We don't get to conflate North African Jewry with West African Jewry. You pointed out in your map in relationship to this question you just asked, synagogues in West Africa. I thought that was really silly of you because we could do the same thing with Europe. We could do the same thing with Israel. And look, look at all these synagogues, Zion Lex. This proves they're the people. That was a silly move of you to point out synagogues in West Africa. The problem with the West African Jewry claim is that it doesn't have a paper trail. It simply doesn't have the paper trail that Jews always leave. They always leave buildings and books. And in West Africa, you don't have it. Okay, I'm satisfied with your answer because you didn't answer the question. So I'm going to move on to my next question. By the way, Sonata, how many more minutes do I have in the question? I we got make sure five minutes and 40 seconds. Five minutes and 40 seconds. Five minutes and 40 seconds. Okay, so my next question to you is this. Um, you spoke of throughout tonight's discussion, uh, what is an Israelite from the lens of what the Bible teaches? Um, mm -hmm. I said that the title is, Who are the Biblical Israelites Today? is a historical title. And maybe you understood that differently, and, and that could be fine. So I want to pin you now to looking again at history, and I'm going to ask you this question. What historical sources have you looked at that validate or attempt to validate why it is that Ashkenazic Jews are not considered original Jews uh, versus them being converts? What historical sources have you looked at? Well, I've read all of the 13th tribe, so I've read things against this. I've read all of Shon Lo-San's book. It's so funny when Israelites like yourself bring up that book. It's like if you've read it, you realize Shon Lo-San doesn't even believe in the Bible. Shon Lo-San doesn't even think the Exodus happened. And then we got people that say they're faithful to the scripture, holding it up. Like, look, if you've read the full Bible, you understand the position from which he argues from, and you can't hold what he does and be consistent. 13th tribe, he says that his research, which has been peer-reviewed and blasted but i'll tell you what he says he says that his research only applies to ashkenazim and his numbers are speculative 
He doesn't even touch Sephardic and other groups. So these books that you guys trumpet out don't work. So what I've done is I've looked at the claims. And when people cite things that they got from Windsor, you know they're really off and really desperate then. Because some of these arguments I know originally derived from Windsor, such as a million and then it was 100,000 at a different point in your presentation. So all these sources don't prove what Israelites say they do. Time. Right on time. All right. All right. Thank you. So it's clear that you haven't looked at sources. Uh, you pulled out the 13th tribe. You spoke about reading all of Shalomo Sands books. By the way, you do have books in the background. So my next question is to ask you, can you show us those books and sources? Can you show us all of Shalomo Sands works? And can you also show us the 13th tribe? I believe you're at home, right? Can you yeah, show that? 13 tribe and, and Shalomo no, Sands books. No, oh, time out. I wanted you to be clear on what I'm asking you to do. Can you show us all of Shalomo Sands books that you said you've read? And can you show us the 13th tribe? You said you read it. You're at home. I see books. Can you just show us? That's my question. Number one, I didn't say I read all of his books. I said I you read did. all of I said I read all of that you book. Him. You got to let him ask. All of that him. book. I don't know why. You, I said I've read all of that book, not every single book that Shlomo Sand has ever written. I've read all of the invention of the Jewish people. That's what I said. I didn't say I've read every single book he wrote because everyone is not relevant. So I have read all of it, number one. Number two, uh, both of those I have digitally. Those are available digitally. Those are not physical books. The fact is I've read them unlike most Hebrew Israelites. So I don't know what that accomplishes, Zion Lex. Okay, so what it accomplishes is to show the people that, like most people of your caliber, you don't care enough to actually read books. You go online and you look at PDFs and you copy and paste the part that you That's think a lie. is relative. That's You're lying I'm, on I'm, me. I'm, by the way, I'm talking, so please yeah, stop. No, I'm, 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 by the way, like I'm, I'm, no, you yeah, saw that. Then I'm going to pull up the PDF. I'm going to pull it up the PDF. Matter. I, I, don't, I don't like time, you. You're time. lying. Time. Stop in the clock. Stop. It's going to change Number the nature one. of debate if okay. you start lying on me, bro. Okay. Don't do that, brother. You're losing your cool. Yo, both of y'all, hold on. When Zion is talking on his time vocab, you can't talk. Vice versa. When vocab is talking, <laughs> Zion, you can't talk. You got to let him get his minute. Zion, um, vocab, you got to let him answer the question. Whether he's lying or whether he's not right, you got to let him answer without in, um, in, un, uninterrupted. And when it's time for you to answer, then you can bring that forth and let the people know he's lying. <laughs> Simple as that. And he can't cut you off. So that's how we're going to keep it clean. Um, people, some people does these tricks to knock you off your post. Not saying Zion do it, not saying you do it, vocab, but you still got to maintain the quorum. That's it. All right. Um, Zion, you got two right. Minutes All right. and 24 seconds left. It's on you, Zion. All right. Thank you very much. Now, bringing up the fact that a historian that talks about things that are historical doesn't believe in the Bible is completely irrelevant because we're talking about history. And as I mentioned, and I'm glad that he's proving my point, scholars of his caliber, the only thing that they do is they look at PDFs that verify and validate the part of the argument that they like and they believe fits their argument and they share that. Many of them do not read in full the works. But as I'm showing and can show on the screen clearly is that... um. Shalomo San writes The Invention of the Jewish People. That's the book that you were referring to that you said you read all of, but you can't show, even though behind you is a big bookshelf. He also wrote How I Stopped Being a Jew by Shalomo San. Let me see. Make sure everybody can see. All right. He also wrote How I Stopped Being a Jew. So what I'm showing, and I'm clearly showing, is that a person of this caliber, so I if you could put back the screen on both of us, I appreciate that. All right. What I'm, what I'm showing is somebody of this caliber that is literally sitting in their home, surrounded by books, but telling you they have these books and they read these books, but when asked, can we see the books, they don't have the books. I'm just trying to show you that one of the reasons why people discredit and disannul the Hebrew doctrine is because they haven't studied it in full or invasively, right? Looking at PDFs and scourging online for the parts that agree with your narrative, that does not show scholarship. Real scholars actually are tangible with their material, which brings me to my second question for vocab alone once he stops sharing, uh, in my next question once he stops sharing his screen. All right, let's go. How many minutes do I have left? You got 37 seconds left. Mm. 
I have 37 seconds to at to ask. And how many does he have the answer? Still 60? Yes, just one minute. Mm, okay. All right, here's my last question. All right. So in looking at um the expulsion of Jews from Spain and Portugal, what historical documents have you looked at that show that Jews went into Africa? And what historical documents did you look at to show that Jews went into Europe from the expulsion of Spain and Portugal? Well, we got royal decrees and whatnot from Ferdinand and Isabella to talk about this stuff. They got all excited about it. So there's primary sources in relationship to the expulsion from Spain. In relationship of flying, fleeing into uh, northern Africa, Josephus does say that's where some people went. Now, that's not the only place he says he went. As well as the guy you brought up, uh, the Danai earlier, he mentions that. But he also mentions Persia and Babylon and a number of places. He doesn't just mention the African continent. And that's one thing about these debates I find very dishonest and disingenuous. Us. They'll mention only the African places, and it's usually, again, North Africa. You don't get to switch out automatically north with west. Uh, you have North Africa mentioned as if it covers all of Africa and then leaving out the other places they went. So there's a dishonesty there, and I think you've displayed that fundamental dishonesty tonight, as well as your complete ignorance that you think scholars only work with physical printed material. That is the silliest thing I've ever heard and shows you've never done Gra post grad studies in an academic arena. You're an EMT. You don't know what you're talking about. All right. Now, with that, I want to just say, first of all, both of you brothers are doing an excellent job. Let's not mess it up with the ad harms, with none of this. I'm not saying y'all doing that. Let's not mess this debate up. It's clean. The people loving it. And y'all both doing great. Now we go into the third round. 10 minutes apiece. But before we do that, y'all already know, man, Captain Tazoriak is out there. He doing great job. I got a commercial. I got to pay the bills. Got to pay the bills. And so I got a quick commercial, one quick minute. And uh, let me bring in my brother, Captain Tazoriak. Um, Let me see. Let me get this in here. Y'all can go ahead and make y'all bathroom run real quick. But I got to get my, my little brother, not big brother. He's bigger than me, but... Pause, pause, y'all. But he's my little brother because I'm older. So let's get this going. What's going on? It's Captain Tazari. I'm back again with what I call a 50% off flash sale. What a flash sale means, it could be one day sale, two day sale, or a week sale. It's a flash sale for a reason. It's going to come and then it's going to go. So you definitely want to take advantage. Whether you go to my Etsy site or Amazon, you get 50% off of all of them. Two day shipping. You order it. It's shipped within two days. I have my original scents, like Fourth Dimension Original, Virtuous, Forbidden, Irresistible, Blue Man, Gold Butter. I also have new scents, like Sweet Blue, Deep Blue, uh, Moments, which is a nice, good, clean scent. Magnus, which is the replacement for Magnum. Any scent or flavor that you like, I have it covered. I got the body scrubs coming. They should be available by tomorrow. So you definitely want to take advantage of this flash sale support and the reason why you want to take advantage of it because you know y'all got y'all got them hearts coming up man february valentine's day coming up this is the best time to take advantage of the captain sale he got good reviews make sure y'all support your people support your people all right we back to the third round vocab are you ready Vocab, are you ready? Oh, he's on the phone. Come on, go ahead. No, sorry, I was just setting my timer. Sorry about okay. that. Okay, are you ready, Vocab? This is yeah. your last and final round, and this round is 10 minutes, brother. All and right. right after this, we're going to open it up. I want the people out there in the audience, remember the topic. Ask questions on the topic. All right, come in, ask your questions, get out. Ain't no hanging out. Just come in, ask your question, get out, because other people want to come in and ask the questions. Ain't no hanging out tonight. This is a debate. All right, so vocab, you got 10 minutes in this round. Your screen is up, and time will start when you're ready. Uh, for this one, I'm not going to share the screen. I'm going to... Okay. Gonna... Well, I'm, I might bring that up later. We'll see. Gotcha. But here we go. All right, I want to <laughs> cover a few... Huh? Remember, when you hear this... <laughs> You got five minutes left. And the next time you hear it, your time is up. All right, All right. vocab, time will start when you're ready. Okay. Um, are we ready? 
Yes. Okay. I'm going to stop. I want to cover a few things that were made during tonight's debate. Haven't got to cover yet. And uh, one of them was interesting. The Zion Lex brought up the holiness movement. And he brought out how some people during that time started saying, hey, we're the real Jews. He is indeed right. And he is right. I'm known for having these conversations. And what I've been able to show through primary sources written by the first folks who they called themselves this black Jews at the time was that the very first time you have anyone claiming that they received this revelation was in 1889, Reverend William Christian. And I have his first book. 1896 is when the first book from the Hebrew Israelite perspective was published. And there's a few things that are interesting about that. One is both Christian and though and the one who followed him shortly after. After Crowdy said they received it by vision, by some kind of secret revelation. It wasn't from studying scripture. And in fact, the argument for Deuteronomy 28 that you'll hear Zion Lex make, he hasn't made it tonight. In fact, Zion Lex has not quoted the Bible once the entire time that I can remember in a debate that is titled, Who are the Biblical Israelites? Because he knows the Bible doesn't support his position. Now, how is a Bible teacher not going to quote the Bible? Leave that for you to decide. It wasn't until 1925 that you have the very first use of the Deuteronomy 28 argument, meaning in the beginning of the movement, it wasn't even based upon that. That wasn't even an argument. You have that in William Cook's book uh, that he wrote in 1925. So this is fascinating. You never have an explicit claim prior to that. I brought up earlier that. It was a silly move that he talked about. Look at all these synagogues in West Africa. Number one, it'd be interesting to know how far those go back. That'd be something very interesting because I know for a fact the rise in the increase of synagogues being constructed in West Africa is tied to a post-colonial West Africa without exception almost, meaning the, ins the ins current uh, surge is based upon missionaries saying, maybe you're the lost tribes, maybe you're the lost tribes. Tudor Parfit has done excellent work on this, and a lot of Israelites just can't deal with what he says. He brings up Harry Rosenberg. That was That's funny to me, as if, well, an Ashkenazi man says it, so therefore it's true. I don't operate that way. He's not my authority. He's playing Harry Rosenberg videos. I'm quoting to you from actual Jews in the first century. Paul, John, Jesus, whose bona fides are established, unlike Zion Lex. Harry Rosenberg, by the way, still thinks he's a Jew. So how are we going to, are we discounting that? Which one is it? So there's lots of problems here. He says well, vocab live when he he said about the European Jews. No, I wasn't referring to what he said. It was one of his last quotes he brought out about someone saying, I haven't heard of a European Jew until the 10th century. And not only that, yes, he mentioned a few cities on my slides and verbally I mentioned way more cities. That was the point of that. And it's interesting. He talks about people going to North, North Africa, but notice he leaves out Persia, he leaves out Babylon, and indeed, Eldad the Danite, if his account is to be trusted, he taught that Issachar dwelt near Media in Persia. That's not Africa. He taught that Zebulon went from the Armenia to the Euphrates River. Where's Armenia at, ladies and gentlemen? I'll let you pull out the map and see. He taught that Ephraim and Manasseh were in South Arabia, and Simeon was in the lands of Babylon. That means most of the tribes, according to your source that you brought out, if you trust him, weren't in Africa by your own source. Why don't you bring that out, Zion Lex? You're saying I haven't read it. Then how do I know these things? Because I have, just like the Equiano book, just like the Hebrewisms book. So that's why I don't appreciate slander on your part. I, I feel like you're better than that, but I guess I was wrong because I don't think you've ever had an academic debate. You talk about academic debates. And this is something that's clear. It's something that's obvious by the way you move. He says, I'm gonna bring out real sources and proceeds to pull out Codex Juda Judaica, <laughs> leaving the Bible entirely out of the discussion, which is just shocking to me. The whole time, his presentation was who the Jews are not. What evidence did Zion Lex give that he is a descendant to any of the people he mentioned? What evidence did he give? He didn't give any solid evidence, and he certainly didn't give biblical evidence. We're at the point now where Zion Lex, in a debate on who the biblical Israelites of today, ladies and gentlemen, is citing the U.S. Department of Defense. <laughs> That's where we're at, ladies and gentlemen. The DOD over GOB. My goodness. 
focused on the Khazars. And then he talks about conversions of the Khazars. Well, there's a problem there with his Masoretes and the Khazars because the Khazarian conversion is earlier, yet he's holding the Masoretes are authentic Jews. There's a problem with his chronology about who he wants to hold on to as a true Jew versus a convert. But let's just say all the Ashkenazi are converts. Okay, let's just say that's true. With Zion Lex, New Old Testament law, that wouldn't even be a problem because that is something that can actually happen under Old Testament law. It doesn't really make a difference or matter if you're going by Old Testament law. But I'm not looking to Moses as my authority. I'm looking to the one that Moses prophesied and said, listen to everything that he says. He talked about the 13th tribe. Again, I do not understand the limited mindset that thinks unless you have a physical book, you don't understand it. It's one of the silliest things I've ever heard and just shows he doesn't really travel in circles outside of an echo chamber. If you look at the people that he says are his teachers, you'll notice they're all people who are within a certain realm, a certain sphere of belief. He lives in an echo chamber. So he's the biggest fish in a small pond, but he doesn't really know how to do these things and how it operates. The 13th tribe has been peer reviewed and shown to be fallacious, but I didn't just go on a peer reviews. I read it and saw his numbers are speculative. If Zionlex has read the books, he will see where Kessler makes the leap in his numbers and then says, there's no way I can say it's all Ashkenazim and the, the, my theory would only apply to the Ashkenazim. And it essentially leaves out genetics as being part of the conversation because that wasn't really on the plate for the most part for him. And in regards to Shlomo Sand, rewind it. You'll see I said I read all of his book, not all of his books. I know of the other book, but it's not as irrelevant. It's not as relevant because Shlomo San is a progressive liberal Jew who doesn't believe the Bible. He is not an authority to me, and I don't know why he should be authority to Zion Lex because all of his presuppositions are anti-biblical when you actually read the book. He doesn't have a supernatural understanding of Israel's history. He has a naturalistic understanding of it, which indeed is a misunderstanding, which seems like something we would agree on. But Zion Lex is so desperate, he's turning to secular white Jews, basically, to try to prove his point. That's a real shame. Don't you think, ladies and gentlemen? Now, as far as how many Jews actually fled into North Africa, the sources don't always agree on that. And notice he didn't actually read, I think, from what we would need to read from. I need to see it directly, not just, oh, he said this. Because sometimes what happens is you'll get one of these historians who will say this amount of Jews were killed in Jerusalem, and that becomes that's how many fled or things like that. So there's a lot of problems with his methodology here. And most of all, we saw that in how he interprets scripture, although he didn't really put much out there because he didn't spend that much time interpreting scripture in a debate. I remind you again, that is, who are the biblical Israelites of the day? Now, I'm going to temporarily share my screen. If you could temporarily share it there, please, Zion Lex. I'm sorry, Sonetta. I'm looking at Zion Lex saying that. Sonetta, you, you hear me? Okay. So here's what we looked at. We looked at uh, these things, and I'm going to re reiterate what I showed here tonight from Scripture. He did not contend a single point. All he did is says, those guys building tunnels aren't the real Jews. Okay, I'm not arguing for that, so it's totally irrelevant, Zionlex. Your obsession with Ashkenazi is not shared by me, and so what you needed to do tonight and utterly failed is go against my biblical lines of ev evidence because, again, the debate is who are the biblical Israelites? The thesis statement, through Messiah, the church is true Israel now and for all eternity. Look back at the debate and tell me one time Zion Lex found anything in his bag to show that that was incorrect. Not a one. Not a one. Woody Allen not being a true Jew doesn't negate this statement, Zion Lex. And I think you know it. You're playing to the audience in a way that is unbecoming of a man who says he's a scholar. Biblical line of evidence one, God called Abraham to bless all the families of the earth. Is that true or is that false? He knows it's true. He never dealt with it. Number two, being counted to true Israel was never based on mere or sheer biology. He never even stepped against that. He never even had anything to say against it. Not even one time. Regardless of who you like, regardless of who you root for, ask yourself, did he touch any of these? And ask yourself, is the title of the debate biblical? Israelites or biological Israelites? It's biblical. Third, the Messiah is the ultimate fulfillment of promises to Abraham. It took Zion Lex 25 years to realize that. He shouldn't even be teaching in the way he's teaching with these grandiose statements. Honestly, Zion Lex should be sitting down under a pastor who knows that Jesus was Messiah because Zion Lex, according to Christian discipleship, you are a novice.
And the fact that it took you that long for Jesus to be recognized properly by you, a man who says he knew scripture for a decade and a half, shows you had some major blind spots. Why not admit that and take the position of humility? I'm not saying be taught by me, be taught by the New Testament. Biblical line of evidence for the believer in Messiah now shares the Abrahamic promises. In every single way, when you have something applied to Israel, it is now applied to the church. <laughs> Therefore, the followers of Christ are the true biblical Israelites. All right, man. We are at the end of Vocab's round, and we at the beginning of Zion Lex's third and final round. Come on in, Zion. The time will start when you start. And family, ready, sir. I want everybody to get y'all questions ready, and then y'all will have a two-minute closeout. All right, Brother Zion, you going to put okay. up a screen or what? Uh, I'm going to put up a screen in a couple of moments, so I'm going to need you to, to watch what we're doing, because when I need the screen to get put up, I'm going to ask you to. You might want to just have it ready. Go ahead, like, yeah, like, it's ready. It's ready. Uh -oh. All right, so oh, I, oh, you know what? I see what you're saying. Let me yeah, put it. You know in the, let me put the in the back. Put right. it in the holster right now for you. Right. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> and when I ask you to share that, please do. Got you. All right. All yep. right. Thank you very much. All right, Tom. We'll all right. So, all right, I'm ready. So, as I've made mention from the beginning of the debate, vocab showed up for the wrong debate. The debate is who are the biblical Israelites today. That is a historical question. That is not a question to examine or reassess the Bible's views. Again, I am a biblical practitioner. I believe in the Bible, but I also believe that when we're talking about history, that we have to go into the historical record apart from what the Bible is saying so that anybody with intelligence knows that there's a space for belief, but there's a space for history. And if you truly believe the Bible is history, then you should be able to align it with history. I'm not doing anything wrong, sir, by bringing history. But by the way, you have not brought a single historical data to confirm anything on topic today. Instead, you decided that you want to give a sermon on the mount to people who typically don't want to hear you or, or what you have to say. So you were preaching to a choir, but not this choir. But let me go on to, to, to say a couple of things really, really quick, because you said some things that were really crazy. You said um, Zion showed a source for Eldad the Danite that said that the Israelites were in West Africa and they went and, and they were considered parts of the tribes of Dan and parts of the tribes of Gad. And he says, but in this right here, it says, by the way, when y'all look back at the video and y'all know, y'all know me, I'm going to play that back this week. When y'all look back at the video, you're going to literally see that he's holding up a notebook because he has no source. He's also not giving you a page number in any book, be it a PDF. And I dare him, when we get back into the question and answer round, to give us the page number for the book and the book name that showed you what Eldad was saying about where those people went. Because we literally saw you hold up a notebook. That's when I started to laugh because I already know what you're full of. But I just want to make sure the people saw it. So we're going to move on and I'm going to also show some things. Let me get into some um, cultural things really quick. Um, Sonetta, can you share the screen now? Sarnetta, stop my time, share the screen. This is what I be talking about. This is what I be talking about. All right. I'm going to just count the minutes and the seconds. Because I'm going to need at least by now two minutes back. We're going to see how long Sarnetta. All right, I'm just going to now speak. Zion, everything good? Yo, what happened? Uh, no, sir. You were gone for about two and a half, almost three yeah, minutes. Yeah, you guys now. were getting the screen set up. So I was asking. Grabbing... Oh, no, oh, no cap. We're not talking about you. Somebody knocked on uh, my door. Okay, so right. um, no you problem. had seven, 
12. So I'm going to move it back to um, 912. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. All right. Hold on. Hold on. Let, and, me, let me fix the time. Okay. Let me fix the time to 912. Um, yeah, I had to run to the door. My bad, y'all. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, you sh so I, I needed you to share the screen. That was the time. Okay. All right. You ready? Okay. Yes, I'm ready. My share screen up. All right, good. So vocab Malone says that um, the sources in the uh, the book, the 13th tribe that talked about the Khazar conversion, they're in question and, and there's no real scholars that support that, right? So I knew he would make that mistake. So I had this ready. This is from the Jewish Encyclopedia, by the way. I'll even take um, the link, but Sarnetta, remember Sarnetta, yeah. You don't got me on. I'll put it on Zion Lex University. All right. I can't do it here. But this is from the Jewish Encyclopedia on the Khazars. And I'll highlight that so that everybody can see. Now we're going to get to this part where it says succession of kings. This account of the conversion was considered to be a legendary nature. Notice. The word was, was considered because it's no longer considered to be legend. We now know that the Khazar conversion, Ashkenazic European conversion is factual. I'll go on. Mind you, this is in the Jewish encyclopedia. Harkavi, however, proved that from Arabic and Slavonian sources that the religious disputation at the Khazarian court is a historical fact. Sonetta. Can you stop my share screen really quick? All right. Let me get back to my Say point. Say that again? Uh, I, just, I needed you to stop my share screen. Good? I need you to throw up the next one. I have one more. All right. I don't see it. You ain't got nothing up yet. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Let me know if you can see that. All right, there you go. It's up. Your screen is up. All right, excellent. So Vocab Malone said um, that Zion Lex, when he showed the picture, he didn't contrast the Egyptians. That was a silly mistake. But anyway, let's, let's keep going. This book right here goes into some of the cultural elements in West Africa. Uh, we're going to talk about dress for a moment. The book is called The Black History Book, and page 149 begins to talk about kente cloth and its origin. I'm going to fast forward some of this because of time, but I want to point out something. Alice C. Lindsay, a biblical anthropologist and African historian, in a work known as the Nilo-Saharan Aran Nubian context of Abraham's ancestors, she has this to say about kente cloth. The origin of the words Cain, Kenan, Kenan, Kenite is originally Nilotic. That means descending from the Nile River, adjacent to, surrounded by. And the name is found among extant African tribes. Related are the words Kente, cloth worn by the Akan, Kenten, the cloth basket, Kenya, the country, and the Kenem, the Kenembu, and the Kentum tribes of Nigeria, and the Kanakuru, who live in Adam Awa and Boono, the land of Noah. There are many other peoples in West Central Africa with names related to Canaan. She's talking about the linguistic connection between the term kente cloth as represented also in the Bible for the Hebrew term. In the Bible, we're introduced to Joseph who wears a coat of many colors. The coat of many colors that Joseph wears is called in Hebrew a ketonet, which Alice points out in her work that the word ketonet is actually the origin of the term kente, which she views as a corruption of the term. As we continue, the coat is said to be a coat of many colors. In 2 Samuel, King David's daughter Tamar also wears a coat, a ketonet of many colors. This is the Hebrew term right here. And she posits in her work that kente may be a corruption of the Hebrew word. Ketonet, 
ketonit. And as you can see, this is the original. I don't know why he did this. This is the original. When you guys go back to Vocab Malone's presentation, you're going to laugh because Vocab Malone showed you an artistic rendition first before he showed you the primary because the artistic rendition showed the Semites being much lighter in color. Now, when you look at the primary, you can literally see that the Semites look very much like the Egyptians, although some of them are a bit lighter in hue, but still would not be ca classified or characterized today as being a Caucasian people, a European people, or even a white people. They would still be considered a people of color. So he's all the way wrong. This is a close-up on the primary, also showing that they are a people of color. But for the sake of cultural attire, I want the close-up here. Because you can literally see this interwoven garment, similar to what you see in West Africa, worn by early Semites in the Levant. And it is draped on their shoulders in the same way that you see kente cloth worn throughout West Africa. Through many linguistic studies and through many uh, geographical studies, many tribes in West Africa posit that they have an origin in Canaan land. For instance, it is a known fact among historians that the Fulani oral tradition of them originating from Canaan land is a historical fact. So when people from the Levant or Canaan land venture to other parts of the world, like many people, what they will take with them is their culture, maybe even their cultural attire and their cultural dress. So if you look literally at the cultural attire of women in Ghana wearing the kente cloth and the style and way in which they wear it, you can literally see it is exactly the same as it was worn by Semites in the Levant. And here is a picture contrasting the two. Not only is it worn in the same exact way, but even the interwoven pattern and style. If I went into the intricacies of it, you would notice that the royal Hyksos ruler that is wearing this type of garment, the way in which it is uh, worn is quite different than the people who are with him. And that's because in Ghanaian, Nigerian, and in West African culture where kente cloth is worn, there is a distinguishing color and style pattern of the king or the ruler among them. So when you look at the Hyksos king, you'll notice that the style and pattern of his is quite different than the people that travel with him. The same that you see it in West Africa. It is always distinguished. The kente cloth that the ruler wears is always distinguished from that of the neighboring people that are with them. Um, in Sheikh Anti Geob's book, Civilization or Barbarism, on page 58, him and both Chancellor Williams connect that the Hyksos are related to the ancient Hebrews. This is spoken by Sheikh Anti Geop in Civilization or Barbarism on page 58, and this is spoken by Chancellor Williams in his Destruction of Black Civilization. Senator, you can stop my share screen. I just want to talk now for a moment, and I want to say something really, really quick. Um, there were people that were critiquing in the chat room that Zion didn't show any African scholars. And I want to make something clear for a moment. I didn't need to show African scholars on this topic because the dagger of this topic was to show that the European Jews were heavily sourced in showing how Africans and Israelites leaving the Levant, coming into North Africa and further migrating into West Africa and forming Israelite communities all throughout West Africa. What vocab wants, Malone wants to do is ahistorical. He wants to act like none of the migrations into North Africa made their way into West or South and Central Africa, even though we know for a fact there are communities of Jews in Central, West, and South Africa today who all say that they migrated into this region from North Africa and is acknowledged and documented by historians alike. But vocab alone would like to keep them in North Africa where the lighter, brighter people are because that would fit his argument. Me showing Jewish sources primarily tonight that show that the 10 lost tribes went into Africa was one of the biggest daggers of the night. Because in Jewish sources, they show that the majority of Jews did not flee to Europe 
which is currently posited by some in academia, but they actually fled into Africa. Then the letter written by the Vilna Gaon shows that there was a huge chunk of Israelites in West Africa that they considered to be the 10 lost tribes of Israel. So again, what vocab doesn't know or understand is when you're having a historical conversation that in part is based on the Bible, sure, the Bible is the premise for which we're having the dialogue, but if you can't show it in history, then you haven't showed up for a historical conversation. And just to be clear, when the question is, who are the biblical Israelites today? That is a historical question. So I say congratulations to Vocab Malone for showing up, but not showing out. All right, man. Um, now we are at the part of the question and answers from the people. And if y'all know me, y'all know I'm going in with the scriptures. I have a question for both of y'all, but um, I'm not going to start it off yet. The first person that comes in, get to ask your question. The link is in the chat. The link is in the chat. I also threw up the um, the voting. I asked my people, don't be biased, man. Let's deal with the knowledge. Let's deal with the information. So everything is in the chat, family. Come on in, ask your question, and get up on out of here because other people would like to come in. All right? So, damn, where is it at? Oh, there you go. There you go. All right, we got... Uh... Peace, peace, Marcus. What's up? So long. What's going on with you? All right. You got a question? Who's the question for? You can ask both of them a question if you like. Uh, my question will be more towards vocab, but vo uh, Zion can also answer it if you would like to. And I want to say, first of all, great debate, Zion. This was... I almost called the police on you for this murder, man. This was, <laughs> this was crazy. I tried to go light, man. So my 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 question would be, in the Bible, because uh, this is biblically in the Bible, nation the, the nation of Israel, right? They descend from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's how they identify, and it consists of twelve tribes as they descend from the patriarchs, Judah, Asher, and so forth. You know, we got Moses, who's literally identified as a Levite because he comes from Levite. You mentioned Paul. Paul literally identified as a Benjamite because he descended from the tribe of Benjamin. You get what I'm saying? And then Ezra, I believe it's like 2 and 59. They got to show their seed by showing that their father, like, this is how you identify as being Israelite. Then you got numbers 1 and 18. So my, my basic question would be, how can you try to change identifying as Israelite literally by blood and by patrilineal descent to some kind of Christian theological perspective of, oh, I believe in Jesus, so now that makes me an Israelite. When literally throughout the Bible, you identify as being an Israelite from your father and being a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and on to the 12 tribes. Okay. Uh, you said you almost called the police. Are you with IUIC? <laughs> no, but... Lord knows they love calling the police on people. All right. Well, it's like this. Uh, I read the New Testament. That's that's the short answer. But the longer answer is it's always been this way. So before the days of Abraham, there was God's faithful. We could talk about Enoch, for example. Depending on when you think Job lived, some people will talk about Job. I'm not sure if that timeline's correct. But we could talk about other people during that time. Obviously, Noah. And Genesis 6 says that men begin to call on the name of the Lord. Adam is described as a son of God. He's not, obviously, he's not an Israelite. So the emphasis is upon humanity's redemption. It's not just upon a small group of people. The small group of people was designed for an end, and the end is to bring God glory via the Messiah. So, Marcus, the answer is, if you don't have the Messiah as the key central interpretive grid of Scripture, then you're simply using an old interpretive method that acts like Yeshua never came, but he has come. So it's essential upon us. Plus, this is how Jesus himself 
and the disciples interpreted scripture. So all the scriptures I showed to show the way they interpreted scripture was it was centrally focused on Jesus. Discussions about Israel were applied to Jesus. And the list goes on and on and on. So I think with all due respect, you and I have a fundamental misunderstanding of what the whole point of the Abrahamic covenant was in the first place. And you have a fundamental understanding about what it means to be a true Israelite. Because I can tell you for a fact, Judas is not going to make it into the kingdom. And neither is Ahab. And they were Israelites by blood. And yet the axe is at the root, like John the Baptist said. Do you want to respond to that, Zion? Yes, I, I definitely want to respond to that. And I want to respond by saying in the Bible... A person is considered a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because they are a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, there, there is a conversation about whether or not a convert is considered part of Israel. And there is a context in which converts are considered part of Israel, but converts were never considered to be Israelites. Even European Jews make the distinction of a person being Jewish and a person being Israelite by blood. And that is literally the language that they use. But again, you know, vocab doesn't really go into those areas of really exegeting what Jews teach. So he wouldn't even know that. So the understanding then is that there's a difference acknowledged even by modern Jewry about a person having what we call Israelite blood and a person being Jewish. In other words, according to modern Jewry, and I'll use them as the standard since we're talking within the context of contrasting the views. There's a difference between being an Israelite and being Jewish. Jewish is not an ethnic designation. Jewish is a socio, um, uh, is a social construct. Anyone can be Jewish, according to modern Jewry. If you convert, uh, take on the yoke of Torah, accept what they call halacha, go through what they call a ritual conversion process, then you're considered Jewish. So the term Jewish never designated somebody as being ethnically an Israelite, whereas Jews ref refuse to call themselves Israelites because they acknowledge that they're not ethnically Israelites. And that's a huge difference. So All right. Great question Marcus. that you asked. All right. You good, Marcus? You asked both of them, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm good. I, I, All right. I, I got both answered. Okay. Um, yeah, I know me. I, I respect and love my Israelite brothers, but you know, I got to come hard and strong. Pause, y'all. Pause. Um, so here's my question for you, Zion. Um, I'm only coming from the scriptures. We talk about how great the Israelites are. We always talk about the greatness of the Israelites. But the Most High God said, Instead of me saying it, I'll put it up. And this is what the Lord said about the Israelites. So I'm saying, why being an Israelite is so important if all the Israelites do is sell out their God, is, tra is trade their God, is backbite their God. In the book of Jeremiah 5, 28, it says they have grown fat. They are leaked. Yes, they surpass the deeds of the wicked. So the Most High said the Israelites have passed the goddamn deeds of the wicked, of the diabolical, of those who are you see on the corner who are not Israelites. They do plead the cause. They cause the fatherless, yet they prosper, right? And then it goes on to say, in the righteous of the, of the needy, they do not defend. Talk to me about that, brother. So why should I be a why should we be an Israelite if the Lord is saying how grimy the Israelites are, brother? All right. Once you take down the screen, thank you. So yes, I want to be I want to be clear on something. You don't become an Israelite. Okay. That, that's that's what this conversation was about today. You either are an Israelite or you're not. You can become Jewish, right? That that's something anybody becomes, but you can't become an Israelite. You are who you are. Like we don't become um descendants of kidnapped and enslaved Africans. That's who we are. So I want to I make that point. So I want to deal with your question by also saying this to you, because your question is akin to asking someone, because we have numerous sellouts among Black people, and because Black people have lost their way, and because Black people have no feasible reality when it comes to who their God is and what that moral compass should look like, that they should reject being who they are too. So that's why that question for me does not make sense because in the same token, then 
we could turn that around to people who don't describe themselves as Israelites, but certainly would describe themselves as either African Americans, Africans, Eidos, whatever you want to call it, and have those same anomalies in place. So what I would simply say is it is nonsensical for a person belonging to any culture, tribe, or heritage that the decision to that the decision to correct the past wrongs would be for me to leave my station in life, to leave my tribe of men, to leave my people and go accept something new. No, we are taught that we become the change that we want to see. You see, one thing that we Israelites love about the Bible, Brother Sarnetta, is its transparency. Because the same book that tells us that King David was great is the same book that tells us he's a murderer. Because guess what we also know, Sarnetta, about real human beings? As great as they are, is as weak as they are. As their flaws, so their credibility can be contrasted in several different ways. We love the fact that the Bible can point out the wrongs of a person on top of talking about the things that people do that are good. Because you know what? That's real life and that's real people. There is no one that does good all the time. There is no one who that's completely evil. It's called character. It's called morality. And it's called assessing a moral compass. And the answer should never be in looking at the condition of my people and looking at the response of my God's condition of my people and saying that I should give up, it should never be that. That would, akin, that would be akin to me looking at the condition of black America and thinking that I should give up. So that's how I would Oh man, oh man, powerful response, powerful response back. Now it's on you, vocab. You know I gotta come at you, vocab, with a question. You said that Zion Lex should not be, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't know exactly where yeah. it's word, but in other words, you were saying that Zion Lex should not be talking about this because he came in late. He came in last. He came in 30 years late. But have we forgotten what Jesus said to the workers, to the people that was working with him in Matthew 20? Go turn to it for me, before I'm both at, and I want you to read the King James Version. Turn to Matthew 20. 6 to 16. And let's see what Jesus said to the man that came in late. Remember, he said the last should be first. Woo! First should be last. And so he gave all the props and the credit. He gave everyone who came in first, he gave the one that came in last the same revenue, the same thing, because he came to worship them. He came to work for him. So let's go to Matthew's um, King James Version, 20, 6 to 16, brother. And let's read. You're saying you, you want me to read all 10 of those verses? Yeah, that's going to be quick. That ain't fast, man. That, that's gonna, I mean, that's... that's well, I mean, I got it. And the reason why I want you to read it is so we could get the context of it. That's why. Okay. Well, I mean, I don't got... Uh, you want the King James. Can you... I got the ESV in front of me. You want all me right. to go get a King James? Um... You ain't gonna be able to see that right there. I can't see you it. Blow it up just a little bit. I can see. I don't, it. I don't know how to blow it up on my joint. Uh, okay. Damn. Can you see it, Zion? I can't. I or can't do you got the King James, Zion? I mean, I can uh, go I, get. I, I could pull it up. Matthew twenty six to sixteen. I could pull it up, Sonny. Do you want me to yeah. do that? Yes. Go ahead. All right. Just give me a second. Great, great response, by the way, Sonny. Great response. Well, yeah, while we're bringing it up, I think it's a that's a I great wanna, parable. I want to come audacity. with Hold on, I want to come with something with for both of y'all so y'all don't think yeah. I'm trying to I, hit yeah, both. So I, I appreciate that. And then uh, vocab got to get something too. You got to get this work too. So, all right. So, you can share my screen um right now. You got to take that down first on it before you can okay. share mine. The King James, right? Mm -hmm. All right, let's get it. King James, right here. You see it? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, this is a great parable. Yeah, once you get it, I'll read it. Uh, one important thing to notice, this doesn't have anything to do with anyone's qualifications for no, teach. Want, no, it do, because you no, kept saying. It? No, the reason, let me tell you why. Because <laughs> you, kept saying, Vol, Vocab, you kept saying that Zion came in last. Why should he? He came in 30 years late. He came in late. So I want to show you to Jesus what yeah. Jesus said to the ones that came in late. When they accused the man of coming in late. 
Let's yeah. see what Jesus said to her. Hold yeah. on, let's just read it, brother. <laughs> yeah, I am. But hold on, I'm going to tell you what's going on. You said you want a context. The parable that he's telling is about the kingdom of heaven. So if you look at verse one, it says, for the kingdom of heaven is like. So this is not about teaching qualification in the church, number one. Number two, Zion Lex hasn't come in. He still doesn't recognize who Jesus is. He He's not a full brother, disciple of Jesus. Can you just read it, brother? And yes. Then explain it. Go ahead. Well, I'm going to explain it. That's what that's what I'm going to do here. For the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw there standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, go ye also into the vineyard and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out, found others standing idle and saith unto them, why stand ye here? Oh. All the day idle. They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also unto the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. Verse 8. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, came, they supposed that uh, they should receive more, and they likewise receive every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good, good men of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal to us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong, didst thou not, didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine evil because I am good? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. All right, you be able to take that off the screen? Yes, and so right there is letting you know. I know you said it's talking about something else, but it's still... Well, I'll tell you what it's about. You know, I'll answer your question. First one says it's about the kingdom of heaven. And one is the whole parable is against most versions of Hebrew Israelism's soteriology, meaning the way that they understand, rather misunderstand salvation. Because what it shows is it's not about strictly keeping some law, how long you've been doing it, anything like that. The kingdom of heaven entrance is based upon God's mercy. So in the parable, he would be the one who's the, ten, uh, the, the, the owner of the vineyard. So he's saying, hey, this is something I can do. And Romans says that exact thing. He says, God will have mercy upon who he has mercy and will judge those whom he wants to judge. So all it's saying is that it's not based upon works. So this goes perfectly along with Christian Why soteriology, it? but it doesn't have anything to do who's qualified a teacher. If you all want right. to know who's qualified for a teacher you got to go to first timothy chapter three which it says that it lists all these qualifications and you also have it in titus and in one of the lists about who should be qualified to be a teacher in first timothy three and in the book of titus it says not a novice that means not new to what the faith is so someone who just came in doesn't have business teaching now zion lex isn't teaching in a christian church that shows also uh, his his affiliate. I know he's done some conferences, but I'm talking about on a regular basis, you know? Hold on, let him, let him finish. All right, well, I'm not I'll, gonna respond. I, I just wanted to ask the question. Um yeah. great, great, great comeback um vocab. Zion, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I definitely want to say something. What's what's silly about what he just said, by the way, you definitely cut him deep with that scripture. It is exactly what you said it is. Uh that's why it's highlighted on the screen. So shall the last be first and the first last. It's silly to say that because someone received the message last, that they're not fit or qualified or merited to speak or teach. Because he's been quoting the New Testament all night, but apparently he forgets about Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. He was certainly the last among the quote-unquote mm -hmm. apostles to receive it, and he is arguably regarded as the greatest of them all. Mm. And he is arguably considered the writer of most of those epistles. And so what's silly of him to say is that somebody that just had a skill set in the Old Testament only could come and teach the New Testament and be impactful, which is exactly what the Apostle Paul did. He was from the rabbinical school of thought, Old Testament only, but at a later stage in his life, something happened. He comes into some type of enlightenment. And what does he do? He changes everything. And he begins to preach of Yeshua. And he does it in a way more impactful than any apostle before him. Mm, mm, you mm, just got oh, cut. Man. 
But All right, so if, we're, if, if he's responding, I guess I'm responding then. Yeah, so man, I was hoping you would bring up I was hoping you would bring up the Apostle Paul because he's someone you need to follow example. First of all, he took a bunch of time off. If you study his timeline, there's a 15-year gap mention, number one. You should check into that in the book of Galatians. Number two, he had a revelation directly from Jesus Christ. You didn't have that unless you're claiming to be like an REI and say that you did. Paul did, though, in Acts chapter 9. So I found it. Uh, pr pretty predictable that you would compare yourself to Paul, but also pretty laughable because you didn't have that happen to you. And also, Zylex, you're not teaching the full counsel of God. You're not recognizing that Jesus is God. You still think he's some kind of created being. You are ashamed to admit if you've been baptized. So you can say whatever, but the fact that you think Sanetta's interpretation about the parable is wrong proves the point you're in no position to be teaching because you just you you're not even there yet yourself. You're not even there yet yourself. You you don't know who Jesus is. Recognizing him as Messiah is bare bones. You've got to do a lot more than that. I know when I see a man bleeding out, this is sad. He getting cut. Even All right, by so I like, that's just you trash talking. That's, right. that, that, that's, that, that doesn't prove on. actually anything. We're gonna move on. We're gonna you know move saying? on. It doesn't prove on. anything. Let me bring in my man. Asa M. Ka is in the building. Do you have a question, brother? Yeah, I had two questions, and I'm going to keep the pocket clean. I'm going to get off. Let's, do it. Uh, Let's go. For Zion, what lineage of the he of the Israelites are you using to connect them to West Africa? And for Vocab Malone, being that Onculus pulled Jesus up and asked him where he was at and in, in the uh, Tanakh, and he said he was resting in urine uh, due to claiming he was God, how do you now, connect do you know being an Israelite? Let me, stop you. Let me stop you for one minute. I don't know. Are you are you asking questions based on the topic of the show? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Because he said he he's he remember during the debate he's asking Zion. One Zion is making the claim that West Africans are where they would have gone to. I want to know what lineage that they would be connected to as as Israelites. Two. Vocab said the way to be an uh, uh, Israelite is through Christ, but the Tanakh says something different. It says that Jesus is resting in urine for claiming to be God as well. And I want to know how he's connecting the lineage to Jesus. You mean the Talmud? You said the Tanakh. You mean yeah, the, Talmud, the Talmud, right? Talmud, and you Tanakh. mean semen in, in, in excrement, because it doesn't say urine. You mean semen in excrement, right? Well, Jew the shot him out the sky with his semen in that book and in the told the that Yeshua, yes, he fought. So Onculus, the Egyptian, says that he's resting in urine, semen, and excrete. So urine as well, yes. But go ahead, brother. Uh, brothers, I'm a, um, whoever want to answer first, I'm going to just get out of here and listen. All right. Since you, since you asked and directed towards me first, I have no problem answering first. Um, and I'll simply say that the sources that I showed documented in part what lineages among the Israelites came. Uh, for instance, the Ethiopian Jews, Beta Israel, are considered uh, to be from the tribe of Dan. Um, Eldad the Danite pointed out that you also had tribes of Naphtali, Gad, and Issachar. Uh, to validate and add a stamp of authentication on that point, even the Vilna Gehon's letter to the 10 lost tribes in West Africa, as well as Nubia, was directed to tribes of Gad, uh, Naphtali, uh, Issachar, and Asher. Um, I don't know exactly what tribe I'm from among the Israelites. There are tribes that Israelites say that they know that they are from. I don't know for a fact what tribe I'm from. What I do know is that I'm an Israelite because history shows that the peoples in West Africa at the time of the transatlantic slave trade, not all of them, many of them were historical Israelites. You see that not just in their culture, but you also see that in, 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 um, in history and in what is documented. So it's important to point out that a person coming on a platform like this or any platform claiming to have all the answers and knowing everything, that's your marker that that person is a charlatan they're possibly lying. So I'm going to be forthright and tell you, I don't know exactly what tribe I am, but I do know that history shows that there were several Israelites in West Africa during the transatlantic slave trade, even to the extent that we have the account of um, Oluda Equiano 
which documents an Igbo who was also an Israelite. Now I can get a little deeper and tell you that my parents are from both Guyana in South America and Jamaica. And we know for a fact, a large portion of the Igbo tribe went to South America, namely Guyana and Suriname, as well as Jamaica. That's where my both of my parents are from. So I know for a fact that I have that lineage in my bloodline. All right, vocab. You want to answer your you want to answer your question now, or you want him to repeat it? No, that's fine. I think it's yeah. interesting, you know, that he knows he's an Israelite, but he doesn't know a tribe. It's it's interesting, right? And then also, you you yeah, you're think gonna respond about, to that just like he's gonna respond to your question. But go ahead if you want to respond. Go ahead. Yeah, think about how long. Think about how long you'd have to really know, right? If you count a generation about forty years, and then you go back to the days of, say, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, depending on where you landed, it's almost 100 generations. In the 90s, by most count, 90 generations. That means Zion Lex has to know that every single person in his maternal, and I'm sorry, in his paternal line, every single one was an Israelite who had an Israelite father. He's claiming that he knows that by holding up pictures of maps, and arrows and accounts of people that he's not even related to. We call those Just, sources. I want, I, want, I want people to understand how how his arguments don't actually match his claims. And so Zion Lex knows that he can't go back 99 generations and prove that every single one of his male ancestors is somebody who only had Israelite male ancestors, and all of those were only male ancestors. He has no way of knowing that. And that's why he does things like say this is going to be academic and then have brings his own sound effects and 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 do all these other tricks that are like parlor tricks. It's not something you would actually do if you were at a, a, a conference when you're having a real discussion about these things, because he says he's something that he's really not in two counts, one an Israelite and second, a, a man who actually is, behaves in a scholastic way. He's just not what he says he is. Just say you can't answer his question because you answered the question he asked me. You still didn't answer the question he asked you. That's that's sad. You don't even realize that, do you? Yeah, no, I, I, I answered how I want to answer. <laughs> if you remember during my cross examinations, I there's probably about this five times you said this about this five times you you didn't answer di direct questions from me. <laughs> remember that? You remember that, Zionlex? You refused to answer from your yeah, own right. books. Vocab. Let's yeah. ask, let's answer your question, vocab. <laughs> He no, don't even remember what the question say. was on it. Eh? That to me. That, what, what else? What else you want to say? You're talking about. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, do you remember the question that he asked you? This is uh, crazy. No, I don't remember. <laughs> oh man, he ain't here. <laughs> remember, he asked you a question and Zion a question at the same time. Yo. Well, I said something in the beginning. That to me, that was enough. Remember, okay. If you remember, right in the beginning, I said something. All right. You, you guys don't remember that? Right when he said something, I answered immediately. Okay, let Yo. me go to um the cosmic. Oh Sankofa. my god, brother Zion, do you not remember right when he asked it? I answered him oh, right and before you answered, you don't remember sad, that? Man. All right, this yeah, yeah. Sad. Let's go. We're going to cosmic Sankofa. All right, light and love, peace and blessings, everybody. Um, brother Sionetta, thank you for allowing me on the show. Uh everybody. Uh br brother Lex, my question is for you. Um how do you what is your understanding of West Africans' relationship? to like the modern day who Samaritans and then the Mandaeans. Like the Samaritans are, the modern day Samaritans are said to have one of the oldest authentic Pentateuchs, which aligns with the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Mandaeans are said to be a group that survived Roman persecution in the Arabian Peninsula. And then when you look at them phenotypically, you know, none of their, their, their none of their, um, traits line up with West African traits. So what is what would be the West African connection to those groups of people? It's somewhat of a good question, but it, it, the heart of the question would take understanding what the Bible has to say. The Samaritans are not an Israelite group. Uh, the Bible lets you know that emphatically, and Samaritans do not tell you that they are traced from biblical bloodline Israelites. So if you open up the book of 2 Kings, it'll tell you that in the Assyrian exile and captivity, when the Assyrians conquered the northern tribes, they exiled the Israelites, the 10 lost tribes, and put them in parts of their kingdom. 
and they took people from their kingdom who were non-Israelites and placed them in the land. Those people became to know became to be known as the Samaritans. The Samaritans, as the Bible tells you, did not keep or hold to the laws of the Torah, so much so that the Bible says that they were chased out by wild animals until they had to learn the culture and the laws of the land. And it says that they still kept the laws of the land, but it was not in their heart to do it because they were not the people. And so by the time of Jesus, you encounter a concept known as the Good Samaritan. If you take a step back, you ask yourself a question. Why would Jesus be calling this man, this one man, the Good Samaritan? Because historically and culturally, they were not regarded as having morals and ethics. So when he encounters this man that he's calling the Good Samaritan, he's contrasting him against the majority of Samaritans, which were wicked and held to wicked practices, albeit still following the Torah out of fear, just as the Bible documents. So there should be no um, DNA or or physical um, connection to the Samaritans and the West African diaspora and Jews, because even the Bible tells you that the Samaritans were not originally Jews. As far as the other group that you mentioned, I'm not familiar enough with them to give a comment about that. All right. Um, the reason I mentioned the two groups is because one group can be traced to the Old Testament times because the Samaritans and the Jews actually, doc well, the Samaritans document their split on which Wait, hold, mountains. Hold on, I just want to ask a question. So, Anetta, after answering these questions, we going into a whole dialogue or we moving to the next person? I just no, want no, to we got to go to the next question, brother. We got you okay. got to ask the right. next person. All right, thank you. Yeah, just want to clarify good. that. Thanks for that, Zion. Thanks for that. Yeah. We don't both answer. Thank you for your question, brother. Good question. Yeah, all right. Let's go into um my man, Lord Abba in the building. Peace, peace. What's going on? Uh, Zion, Lex, what's going on? Long time. Hey, uh, hey, I'm chilling, man. I'm not too, too familiar with vocab Malone now, but you know that I come out of the school of, of the Maury Science Temple of America. Huh? You're not too familiar with vocab? No, no, I'm not too familiar yeah, with him. Legend, bro. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm not too familiar <laughs> with him. No. You heard the man, Sarnetta. Yeah. No, nah, but I, I mean, shout out to him because he was going in. He def both of them were going in and it made me think about my own studies over the years Go coming ahead. out of the school of the Morris Science Temple of America. Uh, Zion raised some points about the ancient Canaanite, well, the Canaanites, excuse me, being in Africa and the certain African tribes being connected to those who came from ancient Canaan. <clears throat> this is research that I've raised on your platform several times as well, Sarnetta. So I want to ask a question. I want to ask two questions. But so the first question is a simple question. And that question is, are the Israelites defined through the priesthood? Meaning, are you a true, can you be a true Israelite and not come through the priesthood? Absolutely. Uh, the, that's a very good question um, in many, in more ways than one. Um, the Israelite nation on the whole, according to the Bible, is considered a nation of priests, right? The creator says, I made you into a nation of priests. Within, But within this so-called nation of priests, you have a priestly tribe, which are the Levites. Um, and they have very distinct and unique contributions and functions to the extent that if someone is, is found to be carrying out the functions of a Levitical priest, they could be put to death. Uh, David was critiqued for carrying out several functions, even though we know it to be a future um, telling of what the Messiah or the Mashiach would come to do. And so if, you're un if we're looking at biblical culture and understanding it within the context of its writers and scribes, being an Israelite has nothing to do with being considered um, the exclusive priestly clan. The entire nation of, of a, on a whole were considered priests, but within that nation, you had the tribe of Le Levi, who are the Levitical tribe, and other tribes or the other 11 tribes were not. And so being an Israelite did not automatically mean that one was part of the official priesthood. But again, I have to add the contrasting element that the entire nation was considered in the Bible a nation of priests. Yeah, vocab. I would love your answer to that question. Yeah, great question. Uh, and uh, I appreciate that. It's good to meet you. In First Peter, 
there's something interesting that happens in chapter two. So this, you know, Peter is a first century Jewish man, someone who was a follower of Christ, sometimes considered like the leader of the disciples in a way, as far as uh, they went. And he says this in verse nine, applying Old Testament language to a certain group. And I'm going to show you who the group is in a second. He says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's interesting if he's only going to apply this to Jewish folks, it's interesting that he would say, once you were not a people, he must have something more than just genetics in mind. And there's one other thing that really helps us to understand that. And the reason I brought that up is because you asked about priests, in that he applies the Old Testament language that Zion Lex brought up, that it is true. There's supposed to be an intermediary uh, element to what the Israelites were. And that's where they, of course, failed. And that's why the Messiah filled the mission that they fulfilled. Uh, failed. Uh, in First Peter 4, the same letter, it says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Now, here's my point. Peter is writing and talking about Christians. He literally says it right there, if anyone suffers as a Christian. And in that same letter, he's saying that you're a nation of priests, a royal priesthood, all that kind of stuff. Well, that shows that the language applied to Old Testament Israel is now applied to the New Testament church. That's very significant. And one other thing to your excellent question is in relationship to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews shows us that even though Yeshua, Jesus, was not from the tribe of Levi, he was not, he was from Judah, he is yet the most high priest, the final priest indeed. This is the way he's described. That's why his work is done. And Hebrews talks about him sitting down. That means his temple work is done. He has already made the intercession. This argument runs all throughout Hebrews, but especially Hebrews chapter seven, maybe go up to 10 or something like that. And so that's important because in that context, the reason why I bring that up is in that context, he says, well, how can Jesus, who's not from Judah, be... How can he be a priest? Is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, 714. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And here's the important thing that's important to read in relationship to that. Because then he basically says how the former things are inferior to the current things. And then goes on to say that there's been a change in the covenant and the new covenant is better. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 8. Very, very important. I'll just read one verse because I don't want to go too long. Verse 13 of chapter 8 of Hebrews says, In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So the fact is, it's no longer important to know who's a Levite or who's not, because every Christian is supposed to do priestly work as they go out into the world, because the real high priest work is already done. And the fact that he's not from Levi, but from Judah shows that the first covenant, the old covenant is obsolete in the language of Hebrews. Very important. So we're in a different time than in the days of Moses. And I'm glad we are. No, definitely. And, I, and I'm glad, you know, both of you answered that question because I was going to go there. Right. And that is Hebrews 7, 14, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthoods. When, when Noble Drew Ali, and the reason why I bring this up is because of my own studies and my teachings, I'm no longer a member, but y'all's debate sparked something in me from my own research. So he comes with, he does the convention. All right. And there's a woman. Wait, wait, hold on. Brother. All Quiet. right, let me, I'm going to be quick. He has a woman standing next to him. And she has emblazoned on an apron a lamb with the text of Genesis 49 10, which says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes and unto the gathering of the people be. We know that Shiloh is an epithet for Messiah. So my question is this, because I had came up with my own, my last question, my own observations. Is it possible that the Yahwist, this is a historical group, right? The Yahwist took the accounts of the actual Canaanites and they script them in the way that we have them in the biblical codex that we have it today. To whereas the question becomes, are the 
people of the Bible, of the all the Israelites of the Bible, the same Israelites, the, the Israelites of today, excuse me, the Israelites of the Bible. I would I would say yes, based on the fact that I believe that the codex writers took the actual events of these ancient peoples and they then distorted them for their own meaning uh genesis uh, what is that i think that's genesis 9 i'm losing it right now uh canaan shall be a servant a servant of curse be canaan a servant of servants shall he be unto his people when you look into the babylonian talmud we know that the uh the african summoned alexandra Alexander of Macedonia, whom they call Alexander the Great, making the claim that the ancient land of Canaan belongs to them, the Africans. And then they go through this whole thing where the Africans can't prove it. And the people that follow the, the Torah, they- All right, they, let's go, let's go, Lord Abba. Come on, man, I'm, I'm building my point. So si, come on, bro, don't, no. don't rush me. My, my, I think my questions is the best ones that have been asked so far, but I'm a fallback, man. I just believe that the there's a mixture between actual history and the people who actually scripted that text what what are y'all thoughts on that I, I want you to answer that one first zion okay so um and this is with much respect to the um the moorish community because i have a lot of good brothers there i studied among them uh from the years uh 1997 to about 2004 um in brooklyn new york so you know i have a lot of respect for my more my moorish brothers but I'll say this, there's not enough uh, writings from Canaanites to speak towards that context, right? If we're to say that what historians would refer to as Yahweh, as followers of Yahweh from the Israelite groups, uh, took these writings or took parts of their culture, and I mean, when I say there, I mean the Canaanites, then we would have to contrast it against what is written and recorded by the Canaanites. And the problem is we don't have enough writings from the Canaanites about their culture and about their worship from them uh, to go into that context. So that's a great question, but it would be very biased for me to jump in and just say no, right? So I'm going to give you the scholarly position and answer, which is evidence is lacking from the historical record of the Canaanites to be able to even supplant such a position. All right, Volcab, you want to respond? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing that's, uh, well, a few things about this. Uh, one is that there are shared names that both Canaanites and Hebrews did use as far as some of the deities. I don't really think that can be denied when we look at archaeology. Uh, I did a presentation on this. If you look up the channel, look up El El Yon, and, and I think I had another one where I went into this. For example, the Epic of Baal found at Rosh Sharma, and I'm looking at my notes from that from that talk. You'll find these tablets that have uh, poems inscribed about these Canaanite deities, and in that, Baal is a chief hero, and there's El or Il. He's referred to uh, a number number of times as well, and described sort of as the father of the gods and a male counterpart to Asherah. And these are things talked about in regards to Israel and her unfaithfulness to Asherah poles, and even indeed the pagan or Canaanite misunderstanding of El. What I mean is, if you look at the book of Hosea, Hosea the prophet accuses Judah of unfaithfulness because they are still roaming with El. My point by saying that is that Hosea is clearly understanding that El is not the same God of the Hebrew scriptures. So even though you have some linguistic linguistic similarities, and remember, these are not this is not a Hebrew language. Now the languages are Semitic. You know what I'm saying when you talk about Ugaritic and things like that. But what the Hebrew writers did is they had their own definition of vocabulary things for these, and they supply the information about who these gods are or aren't with the way that they describe them. Them. So here's what I'm saying: they may subvert some Canaanite mythology but they're not borrowing it and using it but they'll also all, sometimes take the the ways that the canaanites describe their deities and basically work to outdo them and say no that one's really not god let me show you who god really is and again the way you see they're not the same deities as far as their l or ill is because hosea accuses judah of being unfaithful so it's not the canaanite god uh and last thing about that the canaanite god l or ill he is described as being mortal but hebrew 
El, who sometimes matched with El El Yon, is described as an eternal living one. So the characteristics are uh, different, even though some of the linguistics are similar. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, brother. All, All right, right Sha. Yes, I want to say thank you to Unbiased Sportsman. The gloves are off. Thank you, my brother, for the donation. And um, I have a question for both of you. Real quick question. Yes or no? Y'all could elaborate if y'all want to. But um, my man, um, Amin Rob McCarthy, have a five dollar question for both of y'all. Are the Israel are the blacks, and I'm using air quotes here, are the Israelites of the blacks in America today, the biblical Hebrews, yes or no? I mean, are the blacks in America today, the biblical Jews, yes or no? Who want to go first? I'll go first. I don't have no problem addressing that. The answer to that question is no. The term blacks is a very vast uh, term, right? There are many tribes and peoples that are characterized today as being black. There are many tribes and people today that are characterized or categorized as being white. So no, blacks in America today are not the Israelites. You have people that share the same color and hue, but are different people, right? Different, you know, skin tone uh, don't make you skin, you know, uh, skin tone and flesh tone don't does not make you uh, blood related or does not make you of the same tribe of men. Um, this is what's unique about ancient history is that even though the first world, as it were, uh, the Bronze Age uh, civilizations were all people of color, notice that their names brought distinguishment between them and other nation states and tribes. And so, no, I don't think every black person in America uh, is a Jew. I do now, believe that people... If he would have said African-Americans, would the question, would the answer be different? If you would have said it, it, it could be curtailed a little different, yeah, but it but but it would also still wind up to the classification African American still doesn't exactly tell you exactly what a person's lineage looks like. There are many people today that say they're African American, and you start talking to them, who's your mother, who's your father? And you're like, nah, homeboy, you just third generation from Germany as a Afro-European. Like one of the books that I wanted to talk about tonight was a book entitled The Original Afro. Europeans, I have it on my, I have it here. I'm showing a couple of seconds. Let's talk about the Afro-Europeans. So you have people that come from Europe, settled in America, are black or African, but have no origin, the same origin exactly as blacks here in America. So I'm not the person that's going to use that identify marker and paint that brush and say everybody's that. I think it's a case by case study. And I think it depends on talking to a person and finding out what their lineage is, what's their tribal uh, affiliation and how their parents um, are, who and what their parents are descended from. Vocab, same question. Yeah, if Zion just gave his methodology, I think anyone with a discerning ear can, can quickly detect a myriad of problems because he's talking about find out their lineage, tribal affiliation, and you can only go back so far on that. And he knows that, of course, we've discussed that. And also he said, if you know someone's black, I'm not just gonna paint it with a broad brush that they would be an Israelite, right? That's an interesting thing he says because a lot of his presentation had to do with, well, these folks looked this certain way. And his argument essentially was, therefore I know I'm an Israelite. You see what I'm saying? You can't make a presentation where you're like, oh, look, this is how they look. So therefore we know this. So a lot of problems with this methodology. I, I think it's pretty clear. As far as the question, the answer is yes, if they are in Christ. Okay. Um, it's funny. It's funny that that's funny to you. That shows you don't on. really know who Yeshua oh, is. And you why are you so you emotional, man? I can laugh at what you're saying. Why are you so well, upset? Well, I'm I can't laugh not upset at all. But it, it's just Calm betray, down, it shows I'm just laughing. It's okay. Why are you so it shows. Emotional? A, it shows. Well, Yo, you portray yourself to be vocab. Calm down. It's, it's just a debate, man. I can, I can call you out if if I haven't laughed at. Why? But calm down, man. I'm not doing You're getting upset. Yeah, because you're disrespecting Jesus. Um, my apologies right. yes. for disrespecting well, Jesus. Oh, okay. I, I don't you. believe in Jesus. I believe in Yeshua, and I believe this is a difference between the two, by the way. Hey, man, that was a great, great debate. Yo, peace, peace to the both guys. You know, uh, peace to Saul for having you guys on. I'm going to have to run it back myself because it was a lot of information, but I want to ask both the guys, is it correct to assume that Due to the scattering of Israel, due to the different captivities, um, would it be correct to assume that 
Israel is a collection of different races or different features from all sorts of races? Um, I would say that you can find Israelites among what we would consider today other races of people. Again, phenotype does not determine what an Israelite is. What phenotype look can determine is how Israelites looked in the past, right? But things change with time, right? Uh, due to migration patterns, due to intermixing, people can change. For instance, um, a lot of people have talked in our community about how did your grandmother look? How did your great grandmother look? And among some African Americans here in the country, and even Afro Caribbeans, you have people saying, "Oh, my grandmother had what we call like uh, more Indian features." Right? That's a common theme among Black Americans and Afro Caribbeans that they all say, "Oh, my great great grandmother, great great grandfather looked Indian or whatever." So, on that point, I'm going to say that what defines an Israelite bloodline-wise would would essentially be that bloodline. Uh, you can go into migration patterns and talk about how we can chart the migration of the Israelites to see who they are today. Absolutely, which is what I discussed earlier. But I am not the Israelite that says that we can't be found among other races of people. I don't believe that. I don't believe that you cannot find Israelites among other races of people. What I do believe in is talking about the major groups of Israelites that exist on the continent of Africa who are totally discarded by people like Vocab Milone because of the color of their skin. They just can't be the Israelites. And I think that's silly and that's sad. That's so, um, you know, so well, I, I hey, appreciate- Zion, Zion before, but before Vocab um, answer the question, I wanted to add something else to the question, if you could speak to this as well. When Christ speaks about the lost sheep, does that scattering and does that captivity have anything to do with what Yeshua or Yahweh Shah, however you want to call them? Does that have anything to do with the captivities and the scattering and also the, the phenotype of what Israel would look like? It's and a great I hope question. you vocab, I hope you understand the question because I, you know. It's a, it's a great question. Um, I want to say that contextually, when he spoke about the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he's not talking about literally just everybody that's scattered, but also people who have, quote unquote, lost their way. Uh, you find even the apostles speaking of coming for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And again, that mainly referred to people who lost their way and not altogether always had to refer to the 10 lost tribes, as it were, or the exile and scattered uh, diaspora Israelites. And so I believe that the term lost tribes of Israel is a dual term contextually because it refers to uh, Israelites in the diaspora who have lost a cultural and or religious connection to their own heritage. I also believe that it refers to people who have lost their way. All right, vocab is on you. Yeah, I think there might have been uh, some confusion on Zion Alexis part. Questioner, were you talking about John 10, 16, where Jesus says, I have other sheep who are not of this fold? Is that what you're referring to? I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. Yeah, I, I would say that's that's part of the question. And, and along with, um, I believe it's Matthew when he says, I go to the lost sheep, you know, and not to go the way of the Gentiles. Okay, you yeah. So you can speak towards both of them. You know what I'm saying? Because, yeah, what you said is you, you spoke of the other flock. So that's that's John 10, 16. Other sheep, not of this fold. Uh, when you look back at Isaiah 56, 8. That's why that's commonly understood to be referring to Gentiles. And yet you have Jesus saying you have one flock, one shepherd, broadly united in this community. And you see that kind of language repeated in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. So I would say that this is clear evidence that Jesus is talking about outside of the borders of Israel, but not just uh, in the sense of outside only being Israelites, but ultimately Gentiles. It's been commonly understood to be that. There's good reasons why when you put it to other scriptures, especially Ephesians chapter 2, when you put those two together, uh, it, it, it dovetails nicely. And then as far as uh, Israelites being found amongst all people, um, in response to that, Zion Lex said, uh, or vocab said, because they're not white, they can't be Jews. So that's just a lie. I specifically said that I view Limba, because they have evidence for their claims as being Semitic descendants. I gave specific examples. So I don't know what kind of debate it is where you just lie on your opponent multiple times. Don't say, I say things I don't say, 
unless you're ready to apologize for misquoting me. And that's why when I answer, I hold up a notebook because I'm writing in shorthand, which is a common debate practice, claim, response, evidence. I do that every time you say something. I have a whole notebook. I write your claim. <laughs> I write response and I write evidence. So when I'm holding it up, it's so I can get your words correctly instead of misquoting you and lying on you. So within that, the Jews went everywhere, including Europe, and they basically came out on the other side looking like their cultural neighbors. Wherever they went, they came out looking somewhat similar to those people for many reasons, intermarriage and converts. And on some some parts as well, just simply a lack of faithfulness. You know, you get those kind of things happening as well because of those those things. They end up not being identical as when they first dispersed, say, 2000 years ago. So that's important to understand. But it also means a heavy dilution. That's why it's irrelevant and almost impossible to track. Maybe 25 percent of some of these populations that claim to be Jews are actually Semitic. And that's why it's sort of a silly venture. And that's why I think in the New Testament it says, don't get obsessed with genealogies. Uh, but I think that's a good question. And I think if we're going to be consistent across the board, then we need to be consistent everywhere, including the Jews who really never left the land. They stayed in Israel or the surrounding regions like Persia and Babylon as well. All right. All right. Um, you could drop down now, brother, because we're getting ready to end the show and have these two brothers close out. But I want to bring on my last two guests. Hey, fellas. Good to no, be on, peace, brother. Thank you. Um, Orthodox More, where's Orthodox More at? Orthodox More, you are on the call. What's up, brother? Peace to the panel, peace to the chat. I Good want to be. first say to you, Orthodox More, I heard some great things about you as far as teaching um, the Moors. I would love to do a show with you if you don't mind. Maybe something where you can bring in some teachings on the Moors for Black History Month. I would love to do that with you. And if you can pull together a nice presentation. Shout out to my brother, Elder Yara, who spoke highly of you, brother. That's all I wanted to let you know. Shout so, out to Yara. I appreciate that. Uh, two quick questions for uh, both debaters. Uh, one for uh, Vocab real quick. You, Vocab, you were talking about that you don't believe the, the the Jewish population in West Africa story based upon the fact that they don't have a paper trail. And so I was curious to understand what what paper trail do they need to have based upon your own criteria? And, and on the second part to that, why doesn't the the West African literature based upon the three Alphatash and three Al Sudan that that uh, Zion Lex uh, brought up in his debate? Why doesn't that qualify? You need Torah scrolls in Hebrew. That's why. <laughs> this guy's crazy. I'm out. This guy's crazy. A, okay, Everywhere a, Jews go, they got their books, and they're in Hebrew. Yeah, got you. So uh, Zion Lex, real quick. Can, can I can I respond? Yeah, to that? you got it. Go you got it. Thank go you, brother. So just so you know, that was so silly of him because you don't have European Torah scrolls before the Khazar conversion, yet Europeans posit that they're on the world scene before it, and therefore they're also not the Khazars. Vocab Malone literally said, without a Torah scroll, a Hebrew Torah scroll, you are not an Israelite. How silly is that? So this, this is what I, I mean. It should be clear That's that I'm, I'm literally, I, I, I don't speak when you're speaking, by the way. You have I no don't control lie on you, though, over yourself. So you don't need to. I, it, it doesn't matter. You clearly have no control. And I see why you're losing. The poll is telling you you're losing. You're upset. You and your feelings, you don't know what to do except to personally attack me. Notice that I can answer a question without prefacing the question by mentioning your name and just answering the question. Every single question asked, asked to you tonight, you needed to preface my name and bring my name up, but, but more importantly, in a disparaging way. Yet you're a Christian. You're a joke is what you are. They say that you're an apologist. I just want to say that you're sorry, sorry at being a scholar. So let me address the brother now. So to answer your question, brother, I'm sure you know that that is entirely silly. Not having a Torah scroll in Hebrew does not invalidate that someone is an Israelite. There are several communities of Jews that did not have a, that went without a Torah scroll or a synagogue for hundreds of years, yet they're still validated as Jews. Even Vocab Malone would tell you they're the Jews. But we don't have uh, Torah scrolls in Hebrew, so we're not the Jews. That's so silly. That's like saying the remnants of the people of Kemet that we can find in the Congo region today, that we can find in parts of West Africa, 
they're not actually from Kemet because they don't have the Runu Pert M Heru in the Meadow Necha. You see how silly and stupid that is? I promise you, saw that the next debate, I need a qualified person. But but go ahead, good brother. Go ahead. Um, That's the second question. Yeah, so my last my, my second question is the brother Zion Lex. So uh you were saying I, now correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you said that that uh so uh Vocab was asking about DNA going back to Abraham, and you said we don't have Abraham's DNA, but we have DNA of his descendants, and that you trace your DNA back to back to them or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yes. So just to clarify for the people, what is your haplogroup group and what what was this 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 group of descendants that your haplogroup group goes back to? All right, so my haplo group that I shared is on my YouTube page. It'd be too lengthy for me to go into all of that diatribe at the moment, but I shared it on my YouTube page. I have when I when I did my official DNA, I brought the entire study. I showed my connection to the Lumba in South Africa. I showed my connection to Ethiopian Jewry. I even showed my connection to Yemenite Jews. That's all on my YouTube channel right now. The video is entitled, An Israelite Does His DNA. You can type in, An Israelite Does His DNA, Zion Lex. To get into the argument of me talking about my haplo group, there's a time and place for that, but I'd, I'd rather just refer you to the video as my response. You need to let me throw that up, Zion. Oh, you can. You absolutely can. You, you know, any video of mine, you know you can grab, brother. We, we got that mutual respect, so yeah. All right, gotcha. I appreciate y'all for the time and for your answers. All right. Yeah, thank, thank you, brother. You. All right. Um, last one. We're going to Sun Chow in the building. Sun Chow, you're the last one. And then we're going to have these two great brothers close us out. Great debate from both of them. Let's go, Sun Chow. Oh, thank you for allowing me in, brother. Senator. Uh, question for Sun Chow. Oh. can't see you. Yeah. There you go. Go ahead. Yeah. Question for both of you. Um, uh, in so much as the uh, Israelites of the past uh, committed uh, genocide uh, in order to conquer the land of Israel, um, and we see that going on today in Gaza, the genocide that's going on there, in so much as even Netanyahu making reference to the Amalekites, why is it not fair to consider, though, and neither of you consider those Jews there today as the real Israelites, but based on the genocide of today being similar to the genocide of the past, why would you not consider them the biblical Israelites of today based on their behavior? Uh oh. I'm not I'm not sure on the question. So maybe Vocab could answer your question. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think we had well, I found one logical fallacy in the question. Uh if one group commits genocide and then another group commits genocide, it doesn't entail they're the same group. So there's a logical fallacy even in the question, even if I were to grant that what you're saying is now happening in Israel, genocide. If we were to grant that, it doesn't equal genocide back then, genocide now. And in fact, I would say both instances that you're saying are genocide are miscategorized. So under what happened during the Canaanite conquest of Joshua, that was judgment by God. So God is allowed to judge. In fact, it's his prerogative, and it's even, you might say, his duty according to his holy nature. God judged Adam and Eve for disobedience. That's why we need a Savior, by the way. God judged the world when it was wicked with the flood. That's why there had to be a, a way of escape that God essentially himself provided from his own judgment. And God gave the people in the land their time. He gave them over 400 years. Because when he gave the Abrahamic promise, he said, you're going to get in there, but first these Amorites got to fill up the iniquity. And they certainly did. So if you study the history of the Canaanites in that region, very wicked indeed. But I bring a few things to your attention, maybe one in particular, so I don't go too long here, is that those who aligned themselves with Israel's God were spared the judgment. So if it was a true genocide and you're just killing anybody because it's an ethnic thing and not based upon righteousness, holiness, and wickedness, which that was the real thing going on, then you wouldn't save anyone. But they did, specifically Rahab, a harlot who was not an Israelite, who aligned herself with Israel's God and was spared as well as her family. And so I bring that to your attention. I think that's important to, to understand. So it's incorrect to call it a genocide, but it is God's judgment by the hand of the Israelites, which is a righteous thing to do as they're directly commanded by Yahweh himself. So that'd be my answer. I don't know if Zion wants to respond to that as well. Zion, you need clarification or you're good? I'm I'm good, man. I'm good. All right. There you go. Yeah. All right. So thank y'all, man. I appreciate that. But we got one more question. The brother paid five dollars for this question. Um, here you go. 
Minister Meach, he paid the five dollar question for you. You Zion and you, um, vocab. Question for Zion and vocab. All right. Does the actual African American fulfill the curse of Canaan? Yes. Vocab. I need him to find better what he meant. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> <All> right, <okay. laughs> I'm 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 not reading it full as I'm trying to respond. Yeah, it says, yeah, does yeah. the actual African American fulfill the curse of Canaan? So yeah. no, no. The, the curse of Canaan uh contextually had to do with the son of Noah and how he would be made to be a slave to his brothers. Now, using the Bible's table of genealogy, Canaan is a relative to both Egypt as well as Ethiopia, who were considered in the Bible his brothers. And historically, we know for a fact that the land of Canaan was a vassal state to both Nubians and Egyptians. And so that curse of Canaan in the biblical context would not apply to an African-American. I actually thought when I saw curses of, I thought he was talking about the Deuteronomy 28. But when I saw Canaan at the end, no. So again, the curse of Canaan is relative to understanding the context between um uh, Canaan, the Egyptians, and the Ethiopians, and the neighboring and surrounding tribes, of which historically we know for a fact the Canaanites were subservient to and a vassal state to both the Egyptians at times in history, more times in history than anybody else, and even the Nubians. So that was a person could say that they disagree with the Bible, but that biblical statement became a historical reality because Canaan was certainly a vassal state to Egypt and Nubia. And one other thing to add is that, you know, the curse uh, there in Genesis 9, it falls on Canaan himself, but not really on his, not on Ham's other children. So, you know, Ham's other children, they, they settle in North Africa, according to the text, according to the biblical account, Genesis uh, 10 and whatnot. So it doesn't fall on them. But I ultimately think that this is, sort of fulfilled, for lack of a better word, when God did use Israelites to judge the Canaanites. And so I think it's, uh, my understanding is sort of something that's basically done with at that point. So not not relevant in the modern era in any meaningful way. All right. So family, we getting ready to let these two brothers close out. I just want to remind y'all, be ready for next Friday coming up. We got Elder Yara getting in the ring with Ed's, uh, Edward Dodge. All right. An author, powerful author right here. So y'all better be ready for this. This one also, I believe, is going to be great. It's going to be an excellent debate between these two right here. The time is at 7 o'clock p.m. Same time. All right. So Next Friday, be on the lookout for these two greats right here to get in the ring. That's going to be awesome. Brother Zion, both of y'all, vocab, y'all have done a great debate. We're going to ask you now, vocab, to close out. You got two minutes to close out. You want to share your screen? What do you want to do? How you want to do it? Uh, I don't probably won't share my screen, but uh, it's two minutes, right? Yes. Unless y'all want three minutes. Uh, uh, whichever is fine. It's fine. Okay. I'll give y'all three minutes because y'all did great. So I'll give y'all an extra minute. All right. Cool. Thanks. Uh, oh. All right. I appreciate uh, the topic being asked. It's an important question. Going in, I knew a few things might happen the way they did. Number one is that we'll be essentially answering two different questions because I had a feeling even though it said biblical Israelites of today, that it wouldn't essentially be read that way. It would be read along the lines of who are the historical Israelites and am I related to them? That's a sort of how Zion Lex approached the issue. I don't really think that was the question today. And there was a lot of unfortunate things. The debate could have been more academic than it was. Essentially what I was doing is showing big picture theology, meaning reading large swaths of scripture and show how they fit together within a larger narrative of what's happening in scripture. And that's an important thing for the believer in the Bible to be able to do, especially as it relates to promise and fulfillment.
So number of times what I did is I pointed to the initial promise, which creates hope and expectation. And then after the promise is given, you see historical patterns that God sets up on purpose divinely. This is historical co correspondence that gets created. And that's why you see types and anti-types. And my hope, because I did read uh, Zion Lex's books, that he would understand that, because at one point he mentioned David as an archetype. And I said, if he is able to grasp that hermeneutical concept, then we could have a fruitful discussion. I was disappointed, and I think I was wrong in my estimation of that. I hope that that changes in the future, because I think it could be a more profitable discussion if he's able to grow in that area. Instead of relying on parlor tricks, which is partially what he did here tonight, and I think he's above that. But I don't think he's ready to to grow out of it yet because this could be much better. Nonetheless, I think it was still a good discussion, which I'd like to have something like this again if possible. But this is important to understand. We got to start with Adam. And when we start with Adam, we see God's desire to be amongst his people. God walked in the garden. And then that gets imitated or replicated with the Exodus tabernacle among the Israelites, as Abraham is sort of a new Adam called out from the mass of Adam's descendants. This is made even greater with the Old Testament temple amongst the Israelites. And then clearly in verse after verse after verse, Christ replaces the temple as the place where God's presence especially dwells and the place where forgiveness and atonement happens. Jesus literally says, I am greater than the temple. And when I say Jesus, I can say Yeshua. I think since we all speak English, we should understand I'm using an English translation of a Greek word. That's all that is. We know the historical biblical person I'm talking about, or at least we should. Then you see it continue on with the church as the new temple being described as the house of God, as living stones, as a place where God's presence dwells, as each individual believer. Then you see the final city temple in Hebrews 8 and 9 described, the city that Abraham himself was looking for, and Revelation 21, when God dwells with his people. This is the nature of the argument I made here tonight, which starts all the way back in Genesis and flows all the way to Revelation. It's a thoroughly biblical argument and is God's ultimate intention. When a person is interpreting scripture in an old covenant way, they're in the wrong time frame because the Messiah has come. Unfortunately, it mainly wasn't that because there wasn't much engagement with the text. I myself know no other way to answer the question, who are the biblical Israelites without using the Bible? And last thing I want to say is, if you are in Messiah, then you are seen as being a true descendant of Abraham. And I implore the audience to be in Messiah tonight. Thank you. All right. I gave you three minutes and 40 seconds. Zion, you got the same. And you're closing. All right. Let's go, Zion. Unmute yourself, Zion. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I also appreciate Vocab having the courage to take this debate. Uh, for a long time, I've called for a debate with him. I've reached out to him via social media and said that we should debate or maybe even have discussions. And, you know, we I would say we never got around to doing it, right? Um, I also want to say that um, I appreciate that he, had, he made attempts tonight to address the actual topic. I think that as he made mention that it was conflated what the topic should be. But what's important to highlight is he literally just said that he acknowledged that there would be a disagreement on how the topic is viewed by me so that I would be talking about the one thing and he'd be talking about the other. I heard somewhere that when there's a disagreement on what the topic is, the debaters usually call Sonetta and make sure that the other debater knows what we're going to talk about. So us coming to this event today, I'm almost clear that he knows. I didn't think that he was be coming from a more Christological and just purely religious point of view. I thought that because of the question that he'd actually go into history, right? So I, I want to say that Vocab Malone, it, it, there's always another day. I applaud your attempt. I appreciate your candor, even the, the back and forth banter that has his place in debates. But you would definitely have to get your weight up. Right now, you'd probably be coming in weighing at about light featherweight, but you're in the ring with a heavyweight. This is the toughest environment, which means when somebody laughs in disagreement of a position you hold, there's no need for you to get angry and start to get upset and not hold to your character, especially when you continually exemplify throughout the debate that you're a Christian minister and that this is what you do and that I'm not holding to it. So thank you, Vocab Malone. I appreciate the attempt, 
but I would certainly say next time come better and maybe even come with more people because you lost tonight and you lost horribly. When we're having a historical conversation, you have to come with history. I could have quoted the Bible from sunup to sundown. I have videos within a range of topics that I do that, but this topic was about history. Who are the biblical Israelites today? If you want to bow out gracefully and say that you thought that the topic was different from what Zion is addressing, it was on you to call Sarnetta before the debate started tonight, since you said you acknowledged this before tonight, to be clear on what the topic is. When the topic started, you didn't say, I knew Zion was going to do that. So I just want to say, Vocab, hats off to you. Appreciate you having the gall, maybe even the audacity to jump in the ring with me. But I'm going to definitely need you to think about that next time. Peace. All right. Peace. Thank you, both of y'all. I appreciate both of y'all for tonight. And um, I'm going to say peace to y'all. We out of here. Catch y'all next time. Excellent. Peace. 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 Oh, you didn't know? It's environment tough. 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 Oh, tough. Oh, tough. Scholarship. This is the knowledge you can't get in colleges. If you read from the Bible, obey the commandment and know who your mother and father is. Tune in to Sinetic, cause he the protector of the gods. I'm talking about Dr. Benjamin, use of your cannon and John Henry. We got the scale of my eye, if he light as a feather, let's go away his heart. I am the shrine of Patah. You can say I am better recognize a god. All I see is pseudos and frogs. Kudos to my dogs. I'm sick judo for you frogs. I think it's time to hop off the environment. Oh, you didn't know? Oh, you didn't know. It's environment tough. Yeah. Oh, you didn't know? Oh, you didn't know. It's environment tough. Oh, you didn't know? Yeah. It's environment tough. What? Oh, you didn't know? Okay. It's environment tough. Strong will survive. Commit acknowledge on the rise. Raising consciousness divine. To the truth we subscribe. Jabari leading the way. Shaka I most can play. So I never done open the gates. And up and banging the day. It's the family for the culture. Rebuking all your vultures. Some environment full of soldiers. Unlock your mind. They'll expose you. H.O.K. is the squad. Debating the truth is a nod. You step in the pod or the tear you apart. Oh, you didn't know? It's environment tough. 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 You did it again, man. 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 You did You Original the Ali with a Cuban and a galley send your back on Nile Valley with a shot in a your toe mental actually Toe click the link if your scholarship stop it or just wanna make you cry with the truth no lie my youth in my real story and 21 gun salute pick up me Sean at a brother a hostel a move I like him All I found the black woman at all like dolls and a young a fascist a freedom I don't wall panel, no what time for Bible thump in the minute them see me come. Revidation set from the origin set up. None of them can mother dance on it. None of them can mother dance on it. Never got a pot, yes, what's up, better? Yeah. Uh, uh, coast yeah. to coast, we be banging. Coast to coast, we be bringing all this knowledge, we be slanging. All this in the H and K, we don't do no entertaining. Speak the truth, speak the facts. What the niggas just a layman. Better get on one accord. The future can be yours. Ancestors push you more. We gotta go explore the sciences and math. The future's based on class. You about to catch my wrath. We turning up this track. In the dark minds of the light. The dark heart still fight. We speaking all you night. We gotta make this right. Talk right now. We learn how to stand up and stand proud. No man down. We fam now. How could I come to my clan now? From the early church set up, none of them can mother dance on the top. None of them can mother dance on the top. Them not a one. When I look at you niggas, I see.
see what I'm not. Go take him, a little bit of her, mix it with them, I put them in a the pot. You still can't get none like me. It might sound the same, but it's unlikely. One white tee, if I live it up, you niggas gonna see where the gun might be. I thought I told ya. Apple Nation, Revelation, we some soldiers. Sign that or put this team together, now it's over. Uh, we got the weight of the world up on my shoulder. When you get conscious information, hearts turn colder. Now look at these trappers who rapping the same, so stuck in their lane, systemically, chemically. I'm thinking something is wrong with their brain. As long as they paid and in the chain, I got nothing to say. They in love with the gang. I traded my gang for change, and now that I changed, a few things still say the same. Frankie, I need well, um, thanks everybody for coming through tonight. I want to give a special thanks to the brother that came in earlier. I see his comment up there. Where he at? Where he at? Where he at? Let me, um, um, who made this also possible for everybody to see it tonight? The brother. Where he at? Damn, I just seen his comment. His comment went up that quick. The brother that donated the 200 today. Um, I think it was Black Star TV, if I'm not mistaken. If I'm mistaken, please forgive me, but I, I think it was Black Star TV who made it possible for all of y'all to see this debate. So y'all should be thanking that brother. Thanking the brother. Right here. Here you go, right here. Black Star TV. Shout out to the brother. Thank you for making it possible. Now I can pay the brother. I'm good. We good, y'all. Peace and black power. Look forward to seeing brother Jabari tomorrow. Jabari will be coming on in, you know, Black History Month. And then Wednesday, Brother Jabari supposed to be coming on to deal with Chief X. So be on the lookout for that. And then Friday, we got something coming up. Elder Yara going up against Edward Dodge. Be on the lookout. We rolling. We rolling, y'all. We're going to keep it going. And then um, we don't just want religious debates, do we, y'all? Nah. We don't just want religious debates. Guess what debate I'm going to bring you that we haven't had yet? I don't think we had it. I tried to get it with Minister Inky and Dr. Ali Muhammad. I think it's very important. Health is the wealth. And so we're going to have a debate dealing with health. All right? Nutrition. Minister Inky versus, y'all ready? Nepal should die. That shit going to be crazy. Health versus wealth. I know y'all just think Nepal is just a Hebrew and she only know the Bible. That's where y'all wrong at. Y'all don't know her. Y'all don't know the queen. All right? So she deals with health and nutrition. Trust and believe me. Inky knows that at first hand. They already had a, a, a little going back and forth. For, um, I think it was on this show right here where she had to constantly correct them. So be ready. That right there, we're going to learn a lot from that. Health is wealth. So be on the lookout for that. That should be coming this month as well. All right? So peace and black power to y'all. We out of here. Peace. Hey, shout out to my man Unbiased Sports. Un oh, here. I mean, Unbiased Talk. Gloves is off. Shout out to that brother. And I was also thinking about, let me know, because it hit me. The spirit of the ancestors hit me with it. Y'all know how I always say toughest environment. The toughest environment. And I was thinking today, and I was like, damn, it just hit me. I said, I said, why am I calling my channel Sarnetta Studios? I think I should change the name to the toughest environment. <laughs> what do y'all think, man? Help me out. What y'all think? Cause that's all we that's all I keep saying. That is my theme. That's what I do. The toughest environment. What do y'all think, man? Talk to me about that. Yes, no, keep it the sun at the studio. What? Cause I'm I'm coming to y'all. I'm appealing to y'all. What do you think, Nepal? The toughest environment. Khalil say no. Great topic. Um, I need my name there. Your name is huge. 
Mm. But the name will still be attached to it. That That's never going to go. Because when people type in Sarnetta, it's still going to come up the toughest environment, Sarnetta. That's going to always be connected to it. Okay, my man, V-Man. V-Man show. V-Man. Oh, uh, they saying no. Okay, so I'm gonna go with my I'm gonna go with my crew. I'm gonna go with the family. They saying nah, I'll keep it as Sarnetta Studios. Sarnetta's toughest environment. There you go. That might work right there. Sarnetta's toughest environment. That might work. I don't know. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I got you, firearms. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But still, you got to add, you got to, nothing in life stays the same. And so you want to stay updated, you know, with, with what's going on. And when they enter into Sonetta Studios, it's the toughest environment to be in. So that's why I said maybe I should add that to it. Sonetta says Sonetta is the best. Sanetta is the best. Okay. Okay. Anyway, y'all, peace, love, and light. Thank y'all for coming through. Appreciate y'all. See y'all tomorrow.